You ready? Is everybody ready for playing in traffic? You guys, we have a very, very special guest today. We've been waiting. We've been waiting for this one. We have been waiting. We've been waiting, and it's finally time. Today, we're going to speak with a former deacon, quote unquote deacon, from the WMS COG, the Wimscog. So we, today we're going to be speaking with Anthony, and he was baptized in 2011 in Queens, New York, and he had a very um, interesting experience in the church, and so we are going to hear his story. Thank you for coming on, Anthony. We're so happy. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Oh, that's yeah. hilarious. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah, so, so actually we met Anthony um, back in December is when we met. So we've known Anthony for a little a little short amount of time, and we've um, shared a lot of interesting stories, and um, we're just really excited for the world to hear, you know, some of those experiences that he lived and um, some of the advice that he can give us, too. Oh. Oh, yeah, right. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm excited to, to hop in. <laughs> yeah. So, Anthony, you were baptized in 2011, right before the great doomsday prophecy. How were yeah. you? Um, how were you preached to? So I was preached to on the streets on the Fourth of July. Oh. A little, uh, a little patriot. <laughs> I was um, in 2011. Wow. So you really were like right, right before the doomsday prophecy. Yes. Uh, well, the, the Doomsday Prophecy, you know, it was very ambiguous about the time because um, I had heard 2012 was going to be like the last year, you know, and, you know, they said, oh, even the stones will cry out. So we kind of assumed maybe it's December, but, you know, they also said that, um, you know, he will come early for the sake of the elect. So even 2011. So like immediately, like getting into the church. Like once I was baptized and went through the whole motions of things, like that prophecy was like lingering at the beginning, like, okay, get serious, like, you know, full force. Dang. So, That's an intense yeah. introduction. So as soon as yeah. you got baptized, you were just ready to go, right? You were fired yeah. up? Yeah. So um, I was walking on the streets in uh, uh, Queens on the 4th of July. I was heading over to a friend's house. And all of a sudden, uh, I see two people on the street on a highway overpass and like, you know, they're dressed really nice. And uh, the guy like, so excuse me. And I had my headphones in. So I just pretended like I didn't hear him. And I started to walk past him. And then he started waving his hands above his head. And I'm like, all right, like, let me let me stop for, you know, this nice couple. They're probably just looking for the subway. And when he stopped me, he was like, oh, excuse me, have you heard of God the Mother? And I hadn't, but I thought it was really interesting. I'm like, yeah, no, but, you know, it makes sense. And he was really like, what? What do you mean it makes sense? I'm like, you know, because at that time I was um, previously a philosophy major in school. Oh. And uh, also there was... Um, for anyone who's a big fan of the 90s, there was a song from Dishwalla called uh, Counting Blue Cars. Anyway, if you hear it, you'll you'll understand, but they reference God as a female. We'll put a link at the end of the show notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with that, um, I was like, yeah, you know, it makes sense because, you know, God created everything from nothing. So the concept, you know, of a female makes sense because women do it all the time. So, you know, he was like, re like, really? Okay, can I show you something? And I'm like, God, oh, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm heading somewhere. And then he pulls out a Bible. I'm like, what is he going to show me in this? Like, what's inside it? You know, like, why is he pulling out a Bible? And he starts showing me verse after verse. And I'm just like, I tune him out because it's just so much all at once. And it's like July and hot. And, you know, it's it's a very uncomfortable situation. But I stop him. I'm like, what do you want from me? Like, you don't want to just show me the Bible and send me on my way. You want something. And what is it? So he says oh, to me. Yorker. That's such a yeah, New Yorker well, response. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm like, what's your, I, I, my uh, quote was, what's your objective? He's like, excuse me? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, I felt really bad about it, though. 
So as soon as I was like a little like tough, I instantly felt bad. And he, um, he was like, I just want to do a Bible study with you. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll study the Bible with you. He's like, come now. I'm like, it's the 4th of July. No. So we set up an appointment uh, and he wants me to go to some random town in Queens. And I'm like, no, if you're going to study with me, meet me at a Starbucks near my home. Like, I'm not going to like travel to some church I've never heard of. And, um, you know, he makes an appointment. I'm like, uh, you know, the 4th of July that year was on a Monday. And he's, I'm like, well, you know, what about tomorrow? He's like, no, not tomorrow. Because I didn't realize that it was Tuesday. It was a Tuesday service. So I'm like, oh, this guy has you know, like things to do. So I guess he's normal. <laughs> so we, on Wednesday, the 6th of July, we meet up and we do a Bible study. Uh, he brings some random guy with him. And at Starbucks, we study um, my first Bible study there. So that was kind of like my introduction to the church. And then and did they, you get baptized right away? So here, here's how it happened. There's a study called The Bible is Fact. And I'm sure Tony knows exactly what that is. <laughs> but The Bible is Fact is, like, I feel like it should be like The Bible is Factual or something like that. So they use like science and history and, you know, like a verse here and there. Um, and they say, you know, this is why we believe that the Bible is true. And for me, it was almost like a Notre Dame spin to the Bible. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like, I'm, I'm all about this. I like it. I'm like, I've never seen the Bible in this way. It's very different. You know, I, when I grew up, my family was in um, a Pentecostal church. Mm. So, you know, but I never really studied the Bible there. It was more like life conversations. So you know, the first time I ever saw the Bible in a cool way, I was like, okay, I like it. You know, I'm like, oh, come to the church. So I get That's into the car. Oh, go on. It's an entire, uh, you grew up in a Pentecostal family? Well, right before I was born, my parents left the Catholic church. Okay. And they joined a Pentecostal church. Oh, wow. So I bet you have stories like pre-church. Um, the religious I'll tell you when people put their hands up and they start like speaking in funny languages, yeah, like like, like baby talk. It's <laughs> one of the creepiest things as a kid. Like <laughs> you, I you, can't it, even imagine it, seeing that as a child. So already, I guess you're right. I did have a little warped sense of what church ought to be. <laughs> so well, when you're in the church, they talk down on that type of worship. You know what I mean, Anthony? Oh, like yeah. that's unholy, that's ungodly, that's like, <clears throat> you know. That's so, why their worship is very quiet and like quote unquote holy and everything. Yes. Yeah. To be introduced yeah. to like very different concept of of it's the Bible, so it's safe. But it's a like nicer, like less crazy version than what you grew up in in Pentecostal. Yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely. Um, well, when I grew up, I, I went mostly up until maybe like elementary school, and then I went back for a couple years in high school, and then I I left. Yeah. Uh, at the time, you know, I probably stopped going around seventeen, and now this is when I'm about twenty five. Is when I get preached to on the street. Oh, okay. So that wow. first day, they do um, a, a second study with me, and they're like, oh, the Passover is so important. You know, you're an angel in heaven, the uh, forgiveness of sins. And I'm listening, I'm like, okay, this is cool. They're like, well, do you want to keep the Passover? I'm like, okay, yeah, of course. Like, you know, you say that it gives me salvation. Of course, I want to keep the Passover. And then they're like, okay, well, first you need to get baptized. And I'm like, okay, well, what is that? Because up until that point, I was never baptized. Like the Catholic Church will baptize infants, but the Pentecostal Church, you need to be an adult. So I was never baptized as a kid. I never was baptized in my whole life. So all of a sudden, they're like, you know, would you like to be baptized? I'm like, well, what happens? And they say to me, oh, you just get a little wet. <laughs> so that's um, that was kind of like the first. Um, time I, I realized that they kind of will say one thing but it's like a little deceptive it's like they downplayed it like oh no worry it's just a really quick thing meanwhile you have to change your clothes it's a whole thing yeah. you know and it's a really big life decision it shouldn't just be like 
you know, you just decide like that. Like you had never been baptized before. Tony used to say that if you want to come to Saturday service, just get baptized and then you can come all you want. That's what she yeah, would say. Like, like, no big I deal. I get baptized. No. I just want to come sit in the back of the service. But I think that's part of their tactics, you know, yeah. to just. Yeah. So okay. they want so to get, you get a little wet. Yeah. Yeah. So that you get a little wet. So the next thing I know, I'm in a room with like a, a tub and um, they're like, okay, well, whatever clothes you have on that you don't want to get wet, take off. And that means your underwear. Like mm-hmm. they, they didn't want to say it, but then they just said it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm like, that's true. They do say it in a involved. weird way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a lot more involved than I was originally anticipating on. So, you know, I look at this robe and there's like like a little bit of pink in it. And at first they were kind of arguing like which one's the male robe, which one's the female robe, because they're both feminine. And they're like, oh, put this on. And I'm looking at these robes and I'm like, okay, well, you know, how many people wore this before me? Like I'm getting, you know, so that's my first thought. I'm like, oh, you know, they look cheap. They're probably disposable. Turns out later on, they're not, they're not disposable. And I just imagine like, you know, now looking back at like some sister who's like, I'm going to save father and mother's money and just use less soap. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's just> my... <laughs> um, so next thing I know, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm in a robe. I don't want to freak out. I don't want to, you know, be weird and be like, no, I object to this now after I already said I would. Can I just make a point about that? I think that is so powerful because when you're in a group situation and you're feeling this pressure and they're already expecting you to get baptized, it's just like, it's really, really like almost impossible to say no in that situation. Do you think that a lot of people feel that way when they're being baptized? People feel so oh, overwhelmed. A hundred percent. You're literally talking people into getting baptized. You're like begging them to get baptized. I didn't even think about that, but that I've been in that situation so many times where uh, my brain is like freaking out, but I'm like, I just got to do this thing because I'm in this social situation. I could totally see how that happens. And then that. once you're baptized, then you're just in it, and then you're yeah. they got gotcha. you. Yeah, uh-huh. like I said yes to a little wet. Next thing I know, I'm in a robe. You know, yeah. it's yeah. just like you know, because yeah. like, I don't want to be like oh, you know, actually let's talk semantics about what a little wet means. And you know, <laughs> right. I didn't want to, I didn't want to get in a conflict. So, right. um, <laughs> so I'm in a robe and they're like, okay, get into this tub, get down on your knees, put your hands together and close your eyes. And all I'm thinking is, oh my God, I'm about to get sacrificed. Oh <laughs> I'm, like, they're gonna sac- they're, I'm like, and I'm in a tub. It's going to be such an easy cleanup after they like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm so- I get I get super nervous, but it ends up just being a baptism that I didn't even realize that they were saying um, the name. Uh, are we saying the name? Say the name. So you okay. didn't know when they said it. This is like yeah. a big conflict for me. Of yeah, I didn't I didn't know because at that time it changed now. But at that time, they didn't teach about God coming in the flesh. Like that wasn't one of their subjects from the beginning. That yeah. was later on. Um, the studies like, did were, I just get baptized to Satan? Like what just happened? <laughs> oh, what oh, I because at first there was like words I didn't know. It happens so you fast know? you don't even really yeah. know. And that's exactly like when I when I when I hear like Hosanna, hallelujah, like these are just like I just thought right. on some moment was just like a term. Right. <laughs> I'm like, okay, right. they keep saying it, but you know, it must be something like you know, and I asked one day and like, oh. That you know, this church is from Korea, and that's a Korean word for Holy Spirit. They've actually recently come out to say, "Don't say that anymore." Mm. But that's what they were saying for a while. Like you know, oh, it just means Holy Spirit in Korean. Well, okay, that sounds you know, that sounds good. That is but, naughty, 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 naughty. But so- I found out later that they create the study plan in a particular way. Um, first, they want you to be. Um, completely committed to the law they want you to be like feel like my life cannot continue without the sabbath without the passover if i keep a cross like i'm going straight to hell you know they they teach you all these things then they get you to look at all the other churches through daniel's prophecy as a um as something that's like really you know like every other church is of satan so <laughs> um 
that's when they teach you about An Sung Hong, and then they teach you about God the Mother in the flesh in Korea right now. So first they get you completely hooked, and then after that they introduce you to the weird stuff. That's crazy. So it sounds like as time has gone on, because this is 2011, mm -hmm. that they're starting to realize that if they do that, it's very evil and deceptive and not good. So it sounds like they've changed the practices now, or do we know? Well, you you would know yeah. more than most people because you were still in there recently. So Yes. So now, uh, in order to be baptized, they have to um, confirm that they want to be baptized in the name of An Sung Ho. Okay. How much, at least this is like East Coast, how much do they know about this? How much, you know, um, do they understand what that name means? They just have to hear the name and say, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. That's not, how it was also in, in, on this side. So yeah, they are not really understanding who he is or what that name really means. They're just understanding, okay, Christ came and you know, this is the name. Okay. Get baptized. Yes. So, so, okay. So then you're baptized. And you, so after you're baptized, are you just really immediately in it? Um, you know, you're doing your studies. Are you going preaching right away? And so the last study that they would teach would be um, about the heavenly wedding banquet. And in this parable in uh, Matthew 22, they go through that, okay, there's the bride, the groom, and then there's the guests. But at the end, some guests get kicked out. But, you know, do we want to be somebody who's like, you know, maybe you're there, maybe you're not. Without well, your wedding clothes. Yeah. yeah. So there's another group. There's the servants. And if you want to be a servant whose position's never questioned, you got to go out to the streets and invite everybody to come to the wedding banquet. So that was like the introduction. And, and once you do that final study, they say, OK, go out and preach. And, you know, at that time, they were still talking a little bit about the 10 talent movement, which um, it kind of was announced before I came. But people like even today still kind of talk about it. You know, it's faded because like, every week there's a new like movement or festival or thing like that that they created. There's always like something going on, mm -hmm. you know, to keep everybody engaged. But at that time, the 10 talent movement there, you know, they talked to me about that as well. Um, I don't, but, I don't know what the 10 talent movement is. Oh, I mean, okay. I know that I've heard it a bunch, but I don't really know. Is it, oh. is it too lengthy? Or is it, do you guys well, both want to tell me? Yeah. About <laughs> Uh, a talent is not just uh, you bore fruit, meaning somebody got baptized. Uh, a talent is somebody who's good, who's like uh, they do their studies, they um, they tithe. A good and, juicy and, fruit, not just someone who gets baptized and goes away. Yeah, because you could get a million of those, <clears throat> but you know you want. I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. Kidding. I mean. You know, it's it's definitely something they, they put like, you know, pressure on yeah. like in order for you to do. And at a time there was like people who were winning awards and they get to go to Korea and all this. Everything stuff is they're... posted up publicly for you to see, like how many talents you have, if your talents have talents. And so you're supposed to get 10. If everybody were to get to 10, then we can all go to heaven. Are you guys saying <laughs> T-A-L-E-N-T-S? Talents? Talent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. I'm thinking wasn't like there a Bible, wasn't there a parable in the Bible about talents? Yeah, yeah, there were. Uh, right. There there was um, uh, a, a king who gave like five talents and then two right. talents and one talent. And I think it's a currency, it right? Kid. Some type of currency. Yeah. I can yeah, imagine it's a like it's talents a weight. like on a bird this whole time. No, no, talent. Like, that's no, why no, I was like, I don't understand not, what that study is. That's what no. I thought it was. So I've, I was like visualizing that when you guys say that. No, 10 um, talent movement. So, yeah. so everybody was like, you know, encouraged. We were preaching, we were praying, we were, you know, trying to get our 10 good fruit. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, pretty quickly because, you know, they started telling me about like, you know, the doomsday and um, how I'm working on like limited time. So I was like in it to win it from the very get go. And um, there was a cup, there was a hurricane that was coming and I spent the night because they were shutting down all the subways. Um, Hurricane Irene was coming through 
and they're shutting down the subways in preparation for this uh, hurricane. Sandy came later, hmm. but during Irene, I spent uh, spent a night with the uh, brothers in a brother's dorm, is what they called it, which is like a, a little apartment that like, you know, it was people living on top of people like in this congested little like um, den. <laughs> And you'd have, you know, you'd live so close to the church so you could run there whenever, you know, they wanted. And, you know, you could stay late and not have a long commute. So I'm like, you know what? I like this. I like the fact that there's like, you know, because I was living um, with a friend at the time. But more and more, I felt like our lives were separating. Um, And I'd come home and I'd find like a big bottle of vodka or, you know, like, you know, just different things. Like I felt like where I wanted to be and where my roommate was, was, you know, going in two different paths. So I'm like, I want to live with, you know, the church members. So about four months in, it gets approved for me to move in with um, a group of the, uh, the brothers, uh, you know, and as soon as I do a week later, they transfer me. <laughs> um like as soon as I as I move in, um, they're like, "Oh, now you're gonna go to Manhattan." So can I pause? I just want to mention. Yeah. I just had a realization right now when you said that they um, that they approved for you to live in that dorm, right? But it's like they make you feel like you're s- so special to live there. You know what I mean? Like like you have to get permission to stay there. But in reality, of course, they want you to be there because that's their whole plan, because they want you to go to Manhattan and be their, you know, worker slave. Well, so it's like all about their like language and stuff. Do you know what I mean? I feel like it's their language of like, oh, let me see if you will be approved to live this, you know, life of suffering and hardship. Roommates in this like and get lice and bed bugs. (laughs) Oh, yeah, immediately there's a bed bug scare. Right. Um, <laughs> immediately. I just oh. I just realized as you were saying that, like, it, it just seems so, so crazy. It's, it's just, so ridiculous and abusive. Just, just to, like, just to uh, put, see where you are. You're in Queens when this happens, and then you get sent to Manhattan. Yeah, so I, okay. I lived in a town that was actually a lot closer to Manhattan. Okay. And I move out into, like, this nowhere town in queens that's like where the queen's church is located and as soon as i moved there it's like okay well you know from now on you will be going to manhattan and now my commute goes from walking distance to you know when you leave the church at like 12 1 2 in the morning the subways are not running it would take like an hour and 40 minutes a lot of times to get back home yeah and when you're trying to, you know, wake up and go to work the next day, it's just rough. If the it's subway really wasn't working, rough. did you walk? Oh, you can't walk. You, no, no, no. Um, so what would you do? Well, the subway would work. It would just be on an off schedule. Right? Yeah, so, it takes forever. Yeah, it's instead of the trains being there, like, you know, every 10 minutes. Right, or that makes minutes, sense. Now it's like every hour. Right. So, it became like very and it also very... sounds dangerous. You know, we've heard from people how dangerous it was, especially for the sisters. Probably more for the for the sisters than yeah. for um, you know, some big guy like you. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was always fine, you know. Yeah. I just keep, keep your head down, keep walking. So you wanted to go to the church because it was close, and then when they moved you, now you have this big long commute and it's it's a big challenge. Yeah. So like immediately it was like, okay, well, you know what? I felt like even though it was an obstacle, I felt like really um, blessed, you know, through that because, you know, now I get to go into Manhattan opposed to Queens. This is like the big league, you know, I felt like I got like a, like a promotion in the church and, and that, you know, and I could do much more. And I, you know, I was there and I was still new. I was still only a few months in. So I wouldn't go every day. I would go like five days or six days a week. But my team leader told me, you know, you should try to be here every single day. And if you're not going to be here, you need to tell me why. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, but I feel like 
I have a dog at home <laughs> and I have my job and you know, that's, and really I'm a grown ass adult and I don't need to check in with anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know what? Man, I, it's so infuriating. We had to do the same thing. I remember exactly when my deaconess told me, you know, if you're not going to be here, you need to let me know why you need to let pastor know, you know, because family members need to know where family members are. We need to keep track of each other. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I was only, and I, I was like getting stressed out about it. I'm like, look, yeah. you know, like I, I, I'm suffering at work. You know, if I stay here really late at night, if I'm not getting the proper sleep, you know, I'm going to work exhausted. And that tied in with the fact that they told me that, you know, the world's not going to be here much longer. I was tired at work and I just stopped caring. I just stopped caring. I stopped caring about a lot of stuff. Like I was tired. I needed energy. I'd be sitting there with a whole thing of cookies. I'd just be eating all day trying to, <laughs> um, you know, just get some sort of relief. Um, How about energy and, drinks? Did you guys drink a lot of energy drinks? Um, I, they did. They yeah. all, re they, they would drink monsters like crazy. Right. Um, I've always been a coffee person. Yeah. And that was one thing that they always tried to break for me is that I would mm. just disappear and come mm. back with a Starbucks. Mm. And then eventually I had to stop because they're like, well, what about members who can't afford Starbucks? <laughs> what about, you know, eventually so they put a coffee maker in our church. Do they ever do that to yours so that we could pay, yeah. you know, 50 cents and have these little tiny cappuccinos? Oh, they were disgusting. And they made it so yeah. sweet. You yeah. know, and I'm like, yeah. no, 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 no. Like, I'm like, this doesn't work for me. Yeah, but no. it's not a healthy way of living. Like, so physically, your body cannot be healthy, right? So you're eating cookies, you're living off of caffeine. Yeah. Did you gain weight, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, yes, progressively. And then I, I tried to go back to the gym eventually. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's one thing that um, I had noticed as I was gaining weight and as, uh, you know, I'm like, you know what, it doesn't really matter because the leader of the church too um, would have us go out at like midnight sometimes to grab burgers or mm -hmm. things like that. It was just like, let's go out, let's eat, mm -hmm. let's, you know, and we just would because we wanted to be participants because if you weren't there, then it's like, well, where are you? Why aren't you part of the family? Why aren't you mm -hmm. part of this? Mm -hmm. And you kind of lose some church cred if mm -hmm. you aren't at all these different weird late night things. Totally. And I so, also think that in a way you're sleep deprived, you're not making the best decisions for your health, you know, and you're hungry and you're, you know, you're just, you're just surviving. You're in a survival mode. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, it was like, I wanted to go, but I just didn't have the time to, to work out. I mean, I didn't even have time to sleep. So mm -hmm. like, where am I going to find time to, you know, get some sort of exercise. And like, mm -hmm. even if I did exercise with the, just a lifestyle, it'd be very mm -hmm. difficult. They told us like, you get your exercise from preaching. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to, if you want to like uh, get some sort of cardio, go walk around Manhattan and preach to people. And that was, you know, the way that we were supposed to keep in shape. And some, some people did, like I saw some, you know, some sisters who would starve themselves and they lost some weight. Um, you know, eventually different people started to do that, but later years, first everyone gained a bunch of weight. And then once that started to look like really sloppy, then there was a lot of pressure on different people to lose weight. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, I progressively gained weight. Mm. Um, I, yeah, believe it or not, I came in thin. So uh, very, very well, I think that that's very um, like a story that we're hearing, you know, that um, it's hard on your body and you're just not taking care of yourself. You know, nobody is taking care of themselves, you know. Yeah, compound that by years. Right, Just by years that. and years, yeah. So uh, one of the things when I was in the Manhattan location that really, really was, um, it was something that really stood out to me um, as, wow, this place is really uh, intense sometimes and very uncomfortable. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the leader of the church came in and he said, all the sisters, get out of the room. And they all moved to a different room. And then he had all the, the males line up in a line, like shoulder to shoulder, um, you know, across and, you know, around. And he explained that 
uh, some somebody threw a condom, you know, a used condom inside of the garbage in the brother's bathroom. Somebody you put a condom that's used in this trash can. You desecrated the temple. Who did it? Who did it? Who did it? And going around and the, then sort of accusing people. You, you have a problem with sexual immorality. You, you have a problem with masturbation. And like everyone's in public in front of everybody, all uh, in front of all the brothers, at least all the males. And then like he was going around. He's like, we're not leaving here until I find out who's the one who did this. Who's the one who did this? So eventually uh, one step forward. I just have a and, really good question. Yeah. As a woman, do men masturbate in new condoms? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some. I, I, you know what? It's. Uh, I don't want to use this term now that I thought about it a little bit more, but <laughs> different, <laughs> different folks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, so okay, sorry. all of a sudden, this this one guy he stood forward, and it was like it was you, it was you. And um, he was like, where's his brother? Where's his brother? And had his brother come out and say, you know, he had this here and, you know, a child found it inside of the garbage can, which is like weird. Like, why is a child digging through the garbage can anyway? But right. a child found it and he's like, should he be able to stay here? Should he be able to stay here? It's not just his soul. It's the soul of his wife. It's the soul of the child. It's the soul of the child's mother. It's the soul of the child's father. You know, all these souls are at jeopardy because of him and his actions. And then the brother had to say, no, he shouldn't be allowed to come to the church anymore. Like his physical brother had to say that. And then, he, the, you know, he goes over to his uh, preaching bag, unzips it and dumps out the entire contents of it onto the floor to search the bag. And he's like, I'm going to take this book. Oh, the Bible? Well, you don't need this anymore because you're not coming back to the church. And he went through and completely flipped out. And it was a very, like, everyone was super uncomfortable. And we didn't know what to do. And we couldn't react. We just had to stand there because, you know, in the heat of the moment, like, if you did anything, you'd probably get kicked out yourself. And you don't want that. So you just stood there and, and, and took it and, and took this humiliation to somebody. and. Like, you know, he basically said that um, he had he he had it in his I don't want to give too many details about why he had it on. himself, But he had it from the night before okay. and he didn't realize he still had it on his body, on his possession. And he disposed of it. And that's the story of how how that how it got there. He didn't mean anything by it. He just threw it into the garbage because but you know, in front of everybody, there was this terrible thing. And um, the pastor, you know, he said, oh, no, don't kick him out, you know, just like send him somewhere else. And mm. he got very, like, it was very uncomfortable for everybody involved. That, and, that reminds me. Okay, so was this, can I ask, was this before you were married? This was before I was married. Okay, so Lindsay, they create this whole structure where like, you literally do not look at people as like, like, you know how the pastor was asking him, like, which one do you like? Which one do you want? Yeah. In his mind, he's not looking at any of them like that because we were trained to just think of each other literally as brother and sister. Like, I think it's so fascinating that you have all these beautiful people, these young people in their 20s. And there's not a lot of like, there's not a lot of sex or anything between them because you're scared and like you really only see each other as brothers and sisters. You know, I think it's miraculous, you know, in any other kind of group setting, there would be all kinds of people hooking up and doing all these things, you know, but in that organization, they have such a tight control over it. It's interesting yeah. too, because they don't want you to have kids. And so really the guy wearing right. a condom, he should have been like, good job <laughs> <laughs> using protection. Pregnant, even yeah. if it wasn't in the church. It's true. Jeez. But instead for that whole thing, yeah. oh my gosh, that's just so embarrassing. That poor guy. It's a, oh, it's yeah. an interesting Let's story. In it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is he still in? Yeah. Yeah. He, oh. He's still around. Yeah. Come on. 2011 <sighs> condom guy. Send us an email. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so, and so you're having this apocalyptic belief, belief also, and that was one thing that I really wanted to ask you about, how, how that affects us, you know, because then you stop caring about your work, mm-hmm. your career doesn't really matter anymore. Um, you mentioned that you had a dog, were you able to keep your dog in that type of lifestyle for that, for that long? Um, it was really difficult. I yeah. kept him um, for about a year and like three months after joining. So for the first four months I lived with my roommate, I was able to keep him. And then after I moved in with the um, members, then things got really tricky because my um, demand going to church became even greater and trying to walk him and keep him happy. I really kept him in a selfish way because I loved my dog, but I did not give him a good life. He was home alone a lot. Uh, He didn't get walked as much as he should. Uh, one morning I woke up, um, I woke up you know, like late for work and I go to one of the, the brothers like, Hey, can you please walk my dog? I really need, you know, your help today. Um, I have to run to work and I'm already late and he's like, okay. Okay. And then later on, it turns out like he didn't walk the dog and that he took a nap and then the dog peed on him. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I, I really love that dog. You know, I was with him for a long time. And, you know, it was when I got married that I had to give this dog up um, because they're like, it's your idol. Mm-hmm. You know, your dog is your idol. You can't keep a dog and, um, you know, and be married. And if you want that blessing, then you're going to have to make a choice. Let's go down the marriage trail. Okay. Oh, okay, but I'm so sorry. That's very sad. I'm so sorry about your doggy. But yeah. you know, it makes sense in the cult. In the cult, you know, they can't. You can't be having a dog. There is no time for a dog. You know, you need to be. No a pleasure in life. <laughs> no pleasure. Yeah, it's okay, like so no kids, no dogs. I no- want to. I'm curious when when you became a deacon because it sounds like everything moved pretty quick. That was later. So okay. I um. I'll, we'll, 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 was that we'll, after you got married? It was after I got married. Okay. And it was actually in 2019. Okay. So let's talk yeah. about uh, let's talk about your love story. Is that okay? Quote yeah. unquote love story because love story. No, arranged marriage. <laughs> arranged marriage. But you know, that's what I kind of want to talk about is like how the how love is um formed in the church, like there is no real love because it's all just for the gospel work. Like the reason you're put together with somebody is just so that you can be used for, you know, doing God's work. Yes. Yes. But it's like, where's the real love, you know, like, so that's why you came in as a young 25 year old man, single, single, single. And, um, and then, and then what happened? The world's about to end. The world's about to end. Yeah, it's 2011. Now cut to September 2012. Okay. Okay. So now like, the world's really about to go. Oh, um, that's right. I'm in Manhattan. I become a team leader. And as soon as I become a team leader, uh, the pastor came to visit the church, the infamous one. Okay. The suggestion is that I talk to him about my new duties as a team leader. Okay. So I go and I sit with him. And he's like, oh, you know, okay, you're a team leader. Just, you know, you do, do your best and, and pray to God a lot. And how old are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm, um, I just turned one, which <laughs> was my way of saying I've been baptized for a little over a year. Yeah. Um, but he's like, he, he wasn't, he didn't think it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was like, no, your physical age. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, um, I'm, I'm 26. And he's like, you should be thinking about a family. Why don't you get married? And I'm like, oh, um, because the world's like, about to end. <laughs> yeah. He's like, why don't you marry your branch? And uh, meaning the branch is somebody who invited you. So one of the two people who invited me uh, was a uh, Korean. And, you know, he's like, why don't you marry her? And I'm like, uh, oh, okay like I'm not really too sure he's like he looked at me like and I, I was hesitating and he said uh why you like somebody else and I'm like um no it's just that you know we 
you know, work really hard not to think about this stuff. So I haven't really considered any of this, you know, especially for the fact that like, I only heard rumors about the arranged marriages. I didn't really know like it was legit and that it was actually happening. So he, you know, he's like, okay, you think about it, you let me know. And that was the end of the meeting. And I go to the church leader. I'm like, you know, he's like, what did he say to you? I'm like, he said that I should think about getting married. He suggested this one, but he said, do you like anyone else? He's like, well, I'm like, I think, I think it's a trap. I think it's a trick. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 really. You know, like, look, look around, like, who do you like? Who do you want? Um, so I'm like, oh, uh, you know, if I have to choose, what about this one? No. What about that one? No. What about that one? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll just follow your suggestion. I'll just do what he wants. <laughs> and my thought, I'm like, why did, why did we even do this? And he's like, oh, you know, you want blessings. You want to be able to grab more blessings because, you know, blessings one, it, it's kind of like you need a certain amount. It feels to get into heaven. Like you need to be blessed enough to get into heaven. And then when you're there, these are kind of like exchange for wealth in heaven. Like you do enough, the more you do, you gather, 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 you collect, you collect, you collect, and then you cash in when you go to heaven. Okay. Don't store up treasures on earth, but store up treasures in yeah. heaven. You uh -huh. reap what you sow, okay. you know, the more things you do, that little piece of trash, you know, in the mm -hmm. corner of the church that nobody saw, and you pick it up and you don't show off to anybody, that's God worth saw. so much. Yeah, God mm -hmm. saw every, every, mm -hmm. every little thing. So that's why you work so hard and constantly is because you want to get these blessings yeah. and you want to, you know, store them up. So I'm like, oh, like if this is a way to open up a whole bunch of new blessings. Yeah, let's do it. You know, like, all right. So I, I saw him again and I'm like, OK, I'll do it. And simultaneously, as soon as they said yes, I lost my job because of um, tardiness and performance because of how much like and I was at the job for six years. And now I, I lost it. And I'm like, oh, this is awful. Like, how am I going to get married with no job? You know, like this. So I had to find a new job and I started working in a new job. I'm like, OK, let's get married. And finally, you know, we, we got our rings on like Amazon <laughs> and we went we took a bus after work one day to this church in New Jersey um, where the pastor was at the time. And we got off the bus and it was basically like, he's like, okay, come in. And he looked outside and he saw two, like, you and you come in. And he pulled two people in we sat down. It's like, okay, sign here, sign here. Okay, let's take a picture. All right, you're married. You, and he, like, he points to me, he's like, you know, you're too goofy. You know, you need to, you need to act more uh, majestic. You need to like stand up taller and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Anyway. Why don't you two go to Tampa? Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> like, we just got an apartment. We just, like, signed a lease. I just started a new job. And it's like, okay, you know, like, pack up and go. So we get married in October. I'm like, you know, whatever. Like, you know, the world. Can I ask a quick question? I'm just curious. What is the time between the day he asked if you wanted to have a marriage and then the day that you actually got married? Is that, like, weeks or months or? So Dave? there was, um, it's a month, okay, about a month in between, wow. um, maybe a month and a half. And, and did you guys had, date or anything, or did you talk on the phone? Or so the we tried to talk on the phone. And nobody told her. Um, nobody told her about this. So all of a sudden, like I have her phone number and I'm messaging her, and I'm like, like okay, like let's meet up. You know, let's let's go out on that date. And she's like, so confused. Who is this? Who is this? <laughs> I mean, she she knows who I, I am. Yeah. Um, like she, yeah. she's like she <laughs> asked about me and stuff like that because you know I'm her. You know, she's like, like she, should I turn him in? Why is he doing this? Is she the girl yeah. that's on the bridge <clears throat> at the beginning of the story? Yeah, she is. Oh, okay. So the um. You know, it, it, you know, we, we start to have a conversation, um, but she can't type very well. She can't speak like typing is better. Like just texting with her is better than talking, 
but how long has she been in America? Um, she was there for about a year at that point. Okay. Wow. Um, you know, like, and it was, it was very difficult and we went out, um, on a couple dates. Um, I think like three, two, um, and you know, we just walk around cause she also lived by the church. So we would go out on, on walks and stuff like that around our schedule at the church. Mm-hmm. So it's usually like, like late at night and mm-hmm. we're just walking around kind of like, you know, a questionable neighborhood in Queens. <laughs> and then, um, and that was it. It's like, okay, well, I guess we're going to do this. And, you know, and my thought was, look, as long as we do everything we can, like we're about to go to, you know, heaven, this is, this is it. And I mean, like, even with the whole 2012 thing, like, I was awful at my job. I, um, my, I've creeped my friends out really bad. I think a few people, like, blocked me. Like, they won't talk to me since that point because I was like, it's the last Passover. You have to come. Like, you know, you don't understand. Yeah. And they're like, you're freaking me out. So, <laughs> and then, you know, sure enough, we move in December uh, down to Florida. and times are tough. You know, we get down there and things are really difficult for us down in Florida. So So were you the church, um, were you going there to establish the church or was there already a church there? So at the time there was no church in Tampa. I was going there to help with the establishment. I wasn't there as a leader, Mm -hmm. but I was there, I was going to live in the house and, Mm -hmm. you know, like pay rent, do teaching and um they had me do afternoon service mm. so you're and, still expected to work and then you pay your part of the house yes. church you pay for the food and you help take care of all yeah. the members all the and you're preparing a sermon you're okay and yeah. having a new wife and having a new that wife doesn't speak english <laughs> very yeah. well she speaks mm-hmm. it enough to argue. right right <laughs> she speaks enough to argue. <laughs> And that was like the big problem down there. Yeah. Actually, I had a really tough time. I mean, communication there. is important. And if and if you can't really communicate, that must have been a challenge. Yeah, the, the miscommunications and also the deliberate communications were, it was tough. It was really tough. She, she, she had a very strong personality at the very beginning. Um, over time, like she definitely changed and she became a lot better as like... Um, she as repented. Was, Did, she was repented. she older than you? Was she younger than you or same? Same age. Same, same age. age. Okay. Okay. All right. So then you go to Tampa and, and it's really hard. Yeah. So um, it's really difficult one because I couldn't find a job right away. And that's really difficult. And I'm living off of like whatever I had saved, which is like nothing. I had to buy a car with like whatever like it was um like a busted up jeep the catalytic converter was broken and it was like so loud i'd go to the drive they tell you to go to tampa and they don't even help you get there oh Oh, my god i'm I'm surprised that the car even made it Uh, to florida um i had to get it like in in like a moment's notice remember i just lost my job before i i burnt through anything i had i got to tampa and thankfully i got just a, a you know enough to get to Tampa. And then you broke your lease? Did you have to break your lease? We were able, there was a, a, if you give one month notice, you're able to get out of it. It was really fortunate for that because um, we we were really worried and we had to tell them before we moved in, hey, we're only going to like stay a month. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, you know, like that's really messed up of you guys. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, so going down there though, um, you know, even with that, I had to buy like tables and chairs and all the different things that, you know, a board and I'm contributing all this money, you know, the down payment on the house and Is it- all these things. What? A whiteboard. whiteboard. <laughs> and unlimited uh, expo markers. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, I was just making sure but- I understood what a board meant. I knew what you meant. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Very, very valuable at the church is the whiteboard. You have so many whiteboards. (laughs) It was constantly like arguing um, with my wife and the church leader. Mm. So 
she would yell like, at him, he would yell at her, and they'd get into this argument because they disagreed. And then he would go to me and he's like, if you don't correct your wife, then I'm shipping you both back to New York. <laughs> and then I'd go to her and I'm like, um, let's just try to find some peace and let's not like, you know, let's just, you know, be peaceful with them and let's not argue. And she's like, I was mad at him, but now I'm mad at you. No, and no. now like, he's mad at me. She's mad at me. I'm like, I haven't done a thing. And everybody's yelling at me. I'm not meaning to laugh because it is so painful when you're in it. You feel so hopeless. Like, like, what am I doing here? And why is everybody mad? Yeah. yeah. So eventually their conflict, um, it broke me when I was there. Yeah. 2013. Um, so 2012 came and went. Mm -hmm. And we're like, what does this even mean? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how are we still here? Mm -hmm. And then they toyed us along. There was um, a New Year's message that was like, you know, we cannot consider times and dates. Like, you know, if that's what your faith is based on, then you don't have the correct faith to go to the kingdom of heaven. And then later on, there was a video sermon sent to us from the general pastor who was like, oh, the end is coming soon. And, you know, just remember that this year, the sacred calendar, it doesn't end until 14 days before the Passover. So I, I felt like, you know, they had the carrot on the string and like, OK, I will stay a little bit longer. Um, so that was definitely a shock to the system when, you know, 2013 came and they're basically like, oh, you thought you were going to go to heaven? That's because you have bad faith. And, you know, it's like, oh, OK, you know, no, I don't have bad faith. I'm here forever, whenever father comes, whatever year that is. And, you know, it's just you feel like you were wrong for having an expectation. Meanwhile, you know, you just live your life recklessly, you know, getting debt, you know, losing your job, gaining weight, all these things. Getting now, married. yeah, Getting married. Exactly. All these commitments in your life, moving to another state. Like, I didn't even tell my family when I moved. Mm. Like, I just, I just moved because it was enough to tell them I was married out of nowhere without anybody coming to the wedding, without anyone meeting her in advance. All of a sudden, like, what? Why do you have a ring on your finger? Mm. And... It you was, just explained it was the psychology of that 2012 so well for me, like in a way that I haven't really, <laughs> that they sort of gaslighted you guys afterwards saying like, well, is that the only reason why you were in the church? Then you're. Well, I'm remembering how we would like study furiously yeah. after 2013 and like trying to understand the prophecies that were still to come or ones that we hadn't fulfilled yet that we need to do, you know, how it was our fault. Well, and then it, it was, was also the inspection. There was the inspection right. conversation. You oh, remember God. that? Yeah. Where it was, okay, you know, so now that all so the it's material ready. is here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to check to make sure it's good and clean and right. proper. And right. then we anything need to be shiny. Yeah, yeah. We need to buffer things out. And then yeah. replace whatever just can't get fixed. We'll give you right. a little bit more time. Right. And it was like all these different concepts came out that kind of like string you along. Um, so Eventually, I just broke. Eventually, I just got so stressed because, um, I, you know, they would do weird things like scream at you in front of everybody and, and tell everybody what you did wrong or um, even things that you didn't do wrong. It was like somebody else's fault. But, you know, if you got if they wanted you to be at fault. An example. If they wanted to make you an example. Then exactly. you're going to be an example and you would take it because you're like, I take it. I'll be the example for the glory of father and mother. You know, so, you take it willingly. Okay. So this is where I broke. I was okay. a brother at the time and I was delivering like uh, afternoon services and um, teaching. And, you know, I was sent down to a new state and I was in the house church living there, but um, I, I didn't have a title. And honestly, like that was never anything I really wanted um it wasn't something that like i mean yeah you know you kind of think oh it'll be nice but you you don't like i didn't care if i had it if i didn't have it 
but um, I wrote a few letters at that time and I stumbled across them recently and it was really insane. The words I was using, the way I was describing what I felt, but even though I felt all these things, um, I still believed in the doctrine. I still believe what the church had to say. And, you know, I, I wrote a letter to the church leader. I wrote a letter to the pastor. And, um, you know, looking through the way I, I, I wrote it and what I said. Do you want to read some of it? Whatever you're comfortable with. Um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll hop in uh, right over. And so these um, are letters that you wrote to the pastor, just some of your concerns while you're in the house church. Back in 2013. Yeah. Back in 2013, I said uh, an excerpt from what I wrote to the pastor was the reason for my breakdown and uh, attempted sabbatical is rooted in emotional and psychological reasons. The house became a place of negativity, constant surveillance, intentional disrespect, conflict, oppression, the list goes on. I felt like a victim. My relationship felt less like an older brother, younger brother, rather more like a prisoner and warden. I was publicly ridiculed, yelled, and screamed at for something that was not my fault. Somebody's name uh, made me cry <laughs> and hurt my heart over something he didn't bother getting the facts about, rather made up with his own conjecture of a situation. I was told as a justification for that, pastor will yell and scream at people who are innocent in front of a group of people. Is that true? Uh, he told me that I was gangrene and need to be cut out. Additionally, um, I was constantly placed in a odd predicament as my wife and this leader would argue and fight all the time or do things that would upset the other. The deacon constantly told me I had to stop her from this action or that he would send us back to New York. Then I would try to talk to her. She'd yell at me and be mad at me for days. Their inability to communicate caused many marital problems between her and myself. Um, and I go on to say how um, I really want to be in the church, but um, I said uh, I became unhappy. Uh, there'd be time where it got so bad I was feeling physically ill, unable to eat, shaking from nervousness, drowning in pain. I tried to get away and I asked my wife to move back to New York with me. I felt like in New York I could revive my passion and breathe again. Uh, she got mad at me and she proved that she put her own agenda over my well-being. So, I mean, I, I kind of went in on a few different things in my email to him. And um, the response that he had uh, sent to me was kind of like, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. You know, like, why don't you come back? And he acknowledged his um, screaming methods. He's like, you know, that's not the example from mother, but you know, I did what I had to do at the time mm. um, is like a little out of context, but that's um, his response. Like, so it's it. justified. Yeah. You know, it was just is this email sent to the notorious pastor yeah. on the East Coast? Yeah, I, I, uh, wow. <laughs> I wrote all that. So that was and really I, brave I, of you. And it was yeah. very, wow. I mean, how interesting that you were already feeling those things even way back then. And you were trying to ask for help, you know, from the leader that you were, like, that you no, I wanted to stay in the church. I just, right. I believe in this. I just can't deal with these crazy leaders. Yeah. So I ended up like running away, like, packing all my stuff and just disappearing. And, um, I, they talked to me and I ended up just going back for the services. And then I had left, I went back to New York. I lived with my sister for about a month. And then, you know, uh, my wife talked to me um, and she's like, let's try again. And I'm like, okay, let's try again. And we we move into uh, the neighborhood where we lived before and we went back to Queens. And when I went back there, they all treated me like trash. Like at when I came back and I found out like, actually maybe two years ago, that the reason for it is because the leader who was down in Florida was trash talking me to everybody in order that, you know, they would look at me negatively and he'd protect himself and his reputation because he didn't know if I was going to come back and trash him. So he just went and trashed me before I had the opportunity. 
Wow. And I was wondering, like, why is everyone so mean to me? Like, I, I, you know, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to just go, but I'm going to be a little rebellious. I'm going to grow my facial hair a little bit. <laughs> and, um, you know, they, they would monitor who I was with. They had this camping trip and they invited the whole church except me and one other person um, in the church. Like they, they had all these, you know, like weird restrictions for me. And I'm like, hey, I, I just want to help out. But every time I tried, like, it was almost like, what are you doing? Why are you? It, it was just very uncomfortable. They treated me like very bad when I came back because I had like a breakdown in Florida. So now they were kind of shunning me. But um, eventually I'm like, you know what? Um, maybe I could transfer to another location. And eventually, like I did, I got back into the church and I got very active again. And, um, you know, I moved to uh, one church in Manhattan and then they moved me again to another church because I was doing really well and they wanted me to be part of a project that they had out there. They converted one office to the Mother's Love Art Gallery. Ah, so Just for Mother's Day to explain what that is. So the Mother's Love Art Gallery was something that they did in Korea first, and it had a lot of success, but it was very manipulative. The, they took down the Church of God sign, or at least covered it up in this Manhattan office with this um, Mother's Love Art Gallery sign, and you'd come in, and it would be this free art gallery, and they just took whatever like art they could. They took things from um, Melchizedek Publishing, mm. uh, which is one of their... Um, like they come up with these little stories, they put it into uh, their magazines and things like that. And they just printed them out and they put them on the wall. The idea, the concept was you walk through in a maze and you hear all these touching stories about mothers. Um, you see photos, you see about like little things about like uh, mothers and their children. Um, and the idea was that you want people to cry. You want people to really see about, wow, what a powerful love. And at the very end, it is, okay, let's talk about God the Mother's love. So this way, like the concept was, let's get people like really vulnerable emotionally. And then at the end, the grand reveal, God the Mother. And that. then it was, yeah, so they think they're going for an art gallery. And then at the end, it's like, let's talk about Bible study. So that was the method that they took. So, you know, it was, um, it was, I remember open. this in Denver. Oh, you did the same thing, but this was <clears throat> open for months. Yes. Yeah, so ours was also, and we like had half of our church blocked off and they just ripped down this whole part of the church so that they could create this beautiful museum or, you know, art gallery thing. And it was beautiful. There was lighting and there were pictures and they, recreated all these beautiful motherly scenes you know but um it was it was just it was very deceptive also how come me and mom weren't invited to that you time? were you totally <laughs> were i am we remembering this we didn't go i feel like i thought that you did i remember that we actually made a pregnant belly we made it so that people could put it on and wear it and feel the sacrifice of what a mother is. You know, the ones that you can like, Ooh. they're like the medicine ball <laughs> ones. So we put a medicine ball in and we sewed it up. I well, mean, we were so, I mean, but tell me, Anthony, how about all the work that those members did for that museum? So they wanted you to go there because they wanted your labor. They wanted it, your free labor to build this art gallery. Oh, okay. No, I'm more of a creative then okay, okay, okay. okay okay no don't trust me with the hammer um <laughs> they knew that uh no i was more of like okay let's curate this let's come up with something that as a, a guide you can talk about but the um there were construction brothers who were very you know hands-on with changing it up moving building walls knocking walls down and this is all coming out of their pockets you know mm -hmm. this is this is like not cheap and it's constant. Like whoever the church leader was, was constantly saying, okay, let's switch this. Let's switch this. Let's, you know, so it was always evolving and these members would be there constantly just. Okay, and there's meetings, go. there's constant yeah. meetings about what needs yeah. to be done, what color something needs to be. That's probably what you were involved in, right? The endless meetings that go yes. on for forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's where yeah. the rebuking happens and, 
yeah, it's very um, serious and very, um, at least in, in uh, where we were, it was very um, like professional and very, very serious, you know, because you're doing God's work. Yeah, beforehand, I um, I went there. I was in a, di- in a different location that didn't have it. So I first went there and I was like a little bit of a rat. I took pictures of things that I didn't think looked good. And I'm like, look at this. They don't keep it very good. I'm like, this doesn't look good. <laughs> I, I tattletailed. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I think that maybe, um, you know, I think that's p- probably part of it. I think that like maybe it was the culture that it was something that you should be doing is like pointing out these sorts of things. And Mm -hmm. when something wasn't going well, like you should report it. It reminds me, have you told, have you told your husband yet about the whole uh, tattling on him for chewing thing? Oh yeah. He knows about that. He knows about it now. Okay. (laughs) That just reminded me of it. Like the tattling. Yeah. I mean, you even tattle on your, on your significant other, you will tattle on your children. You will tattle on your parents. I could see you know? how you that mindset too, because you're like, mm-hmm. oh, they don't really like, they don't, they're not sure about me right now because I was rebellious for a month. So let yeah, me show no. them how well, committed it, I am now. My time it went by. Um, there, it was kind of a, a, a quiet, you know, rebuild. Um, you know, I got through uh, 2013, and by 2014, it was, you know, the year Jubilee. Uh, which I think you've talked about before. The concept was the year of Jubilee is 50 years uh, that the church had been established. So in the Bible, Jubilee is when all those uh, servants got to go back to their home. So we're like, we're going home. We're going back to heaven this year. This is it. You know, we we survived the whole 2013 like time of doubt. And now here we are in, in the home stretch 2014. Um And then, you know, I got through that. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to get my hopes up again. And, you know, by that time, like I was doing really well again. And I had a shaven face and uh, (laughs) I was there like every day. And I was very reliable for whatever mission. So I rebuilt that trust. And then that's when I uh, was, was a little tattletale. You and overcame, then, you overcame okay. all these things. Cool. Tony's well, doing quotes. Yeah. 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 Seer. That's a big thing. It's like he had, he overcame, you know, all these things that Satan threw at him or, you yeah. know, temptations or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it was tough. I mean, besides like getting married, my family was really mad at me. My mm-hmm. family, like, especially when I went to Florida and I got married without telling them, like, I meant to ask you like six times about your family. So <laughs> through all of this, what are they doing? Are they like come to Christmas? Are they like we we give well, up? I, what are they doing? I told them right away um, my first year. Oh, I'm not going to keep any of the holidays. Um, the the one I did keep my um, I did keep a Thanksgiving only because I needed the time to tell my family I was moving to Florida. Uh, I went to go see my two sisters, but instead they realized I had a ring on my finger Mm. and I forgot about it. And I'm like, oh yeah, I, um, I got married and they were just so shocked about it. I couldn't say two sisters, two older sisters. Mm. Uh, And I couldn't tell them I'm moving to Florida. Like it was, you know, so, you know, they were fine with the fact that like, I don't keep holidays or anything like that, but um, you know, they, 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 they're comfortable with me making my life choices, but, um, all of a sudden my sister heard a rumor, uh, that I was in Florida mm-hmm. and my one sister, she left me this really mean message. Like, oh, if you're there and you didn't tell me, that means I don't mean anything to you. You don't give, uh, something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, oh okay, like, let me just ignore her for, for a while because, you know, she, she was the one who's also like, it's a cult, it's a this, it's a that. So the more she kind of pushed, um, the more I, at first I was like, okay, let me try to defend it. And then it was just like, let me be quiet. But my other sister, um, she left me a heartbreaking message when I was down in Florida. She was like, I don't know who took you away from me. I don't know who these, you know, what happened, but I feel like I lost you. And she like was crying and I was really emotional. And like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't like, 
I didn't want her to be upset, but I also felt like, you know, the world's about to end and I tried to tell her about it and she didn't listen. And like, what can I do? You know, like, you know, this is just me overcoming. And when, if I could overcome this, I could go to the, you know, kingdom of heaven. This is just, you know, but it, it was a weight on me for sure that my family like felt like completely like hurt by my decisions. Yeah. Um, but that was, you know, when I came back, um, I tried to keep, you know, I moved in with my sister and she yeah. loved it. And then they got really mad when I moved out a month later. Yeah. So I, it, it I feel tough. like I, I just feel like they're not hurt. But they weren't hurt by your decisions because you weren't the one making the decisions. Like at this point, you're just completely absorbed in that high demand. You know, I mean, your brain is just completely you know, you know what yeah. I mean? I mean, you're just in that reality and you really think that you're doing the right thing. And it just shows like how deeply you believed. And even though you knew you're breaking your family's heart, you still do it because you just really believed it was true. It's like, uh, you were like a shell of yourself. Yeah. You were like yeah. in cult identity, a totally different person, but they're like still wondering why that the Anthony that they know they're just so frustrated. It's so heartbreaking because you, you could see all the sides. It's so, such a, so heartbreaking, but yeah. Yeah. But I mean, they were, whenever I, I wanted to talk to them, they were always there. Like, you know, right. like they never, they never put any like extra pressure on me or anything like that. Um, and, you know, even, okay. So like one time we went out to dinner together and they put the food on the table and they saw me like put my hands together to pray because, you know, in the church, you, you cannot eat food without doing a prayer first. So my sister was like, oh, OK, prayer time. And she was like, um, Jesus, <laughs> we want to thank you for this food, Jesus. And as you know, if someone prays in the name of Jesus over your food, you you're not eat. allowed to eat it. <laughs> and then I'll, I'm like, and then I got like really upset. I'm like, you know, Aww. like I'm just praying for my, like I didn't say pray, pray for my food. And I'm like, I can't eat this now. Aww. And, you know, we're at a restaurant and we just get like something, you know, an appetizer to share up for the table. And uh, they, they're like, well, we can't understand all the different things about your group and you need to tell us in advance and da, 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 da. And they get really mad at me. And then they're like, okay, you know what? We'll just order another one. We just order another. Oh, one. that's so, sweet. And then later on, we're with our my mom, and like a month or two later, um, and my mom's about to pray for the food, and my sisters are like, "Ma, stop it, Ma, no." Aww. And she's like, "Why?" And they're like, "You don't even understand. You can't do that." <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> so. Yeah, they um they they were very like supportive even when I was in it, even over these weird um right. quirky things that happened. But Tony, does this know. remind you of Thanksgiving right. dinner when it I would does. come with it you? Does. Tony, Anthony, don't, don't you feel like, like I would go with her? Because I was like, she doesn't have to pray around the food. I'm not doing it either. I have no reason to. I'm just going with her. Anthony, don't you feel like siblings have a um a special place for the for when you're in the cult? As yes. opposed to like a parent relationship, like a parent relationship. I feel like a parent, if they say something to you, you feel like judged and you're like, what do you know? You know, but when it comes from a sibling, it's a little bit different. And siblings have you're... your back in a way that maybe a parent doesn't. You know what I mean? And, and Tony, having kids, couldn't you see like if your kids were doing something like joining a cult, yeah. you would be a lot more like, what are you doing? Did I raise you wrong? Did I do something like did I do something as a parent? Versus right. as a sibling, you're like, do what you want, weirdo, whatever. <laughs> like, there's more of a lead. like, I don't feel like Tony's actions are a reflection of my, of you're, my life. Yeah. But as a parent, your child's actions reflect how you are as a parent. And so it's almost more like personal. I think it's interesting. And then like the, the former mindset that we had in the call, I'm just looking at this conversation. I'm like, wow, that's so spiritual. That's why the children oh. of God have to be good because they represent their parents. 
Uh, yeah, it's just like the uh, the instinctive thing in the back of the head. Yeah, that's it's like these it. thought patterns that we get. Like you see something physical, you think of it spiritual. Like all these these uh, these things that you just do. <laughs> so okay, um, okay. So well, where are we? We are in New York. Okay. Yeah, no, okay. we're at the Mother's Day Art Gallery. Okay, well, so you're yeah, in the Art Gallery. And then um, after that, uh, one day. During that time, every weekend, we'd go from New York and we'd have to rent a 15-passenger van and go up to the main church upstate New York and to drive like over an hour every single Sabbath day. And, you know, we'd have to rent them, you know, and I'd be driving this big van through Times Square up into, <laughs> you know, the middle of nowhere. And it's very, you know, it, it's it's this thing that they're constantly doing. But during one of those trips, the pastor announced that in Pittsburgh, they were getting a new location and they needed to send people. Mm. And I, I hear it and I'm like, I volunteer, I'll go. And we moved to Pittsburgh and we're there for about a year wow. up until um, the pastor then calls us back and he's like, okay, well, we need people to start house churches because we have a quota. We're supposed to hit a certain number in this region. It was like 97 on the East Coast or something like that. So they were like, okay, let's hit it quick. Let's just make, you know, anyone a house church leader. And I was one of those anyone's. Oh and, my gosh. Um, we, we were sent to Baltimore. Um, so after being in Pittsburgh for about a year, we go to Baltimore and we start our first house church. Mm. And, um, you know, so you're the leader. So you're the top leader in the house church in Baltimore. Yeah. And, okay. you know, we, we go and we figure it out and, you know, it's different. Like, I think different places do things differently. Uh, we had to fully self support the house. So, um, they had like a, extra furniture and storage. So that helped us out a lot, but we'd pay the rent. Uh, there was other, like a helper couple that lived with us that also contributed towards the rent. Was it hard and, to go and find a job there? And did your wife find a job there? Well, I had worked something out with the um, with the pastor because originally I was supposed to go to Hershey, Pennsylvania, um, or um, whatever the capital of Pennsylvania is. It's um, where is that? <laughs> Harrisburg. Harrisburg. Good question. But I've always um, wanted to go to Hershey, Pennsylvania. Me too. Yeah, I'm like, let me not go to Harrisburg. Uh, let me go to Hershey. It's delicious. So <laughs> not going to help with the weight gain. But um, so I ended up uh, finding a job in Baltimore. Um, you know, I had a couple different options. I'm like, okay, let's try for a major city. I went to Baltimore. I found a job um, in the industry. They gave me housing for the first uh, month. And um then while we were there, my wife found a job really quick. And yeah, things were pretty smooth sailing for a while. Um, you know, there was, it wasn't like a, a crazy time. It was like, you know, we worked really hard. Uh, we really tried to grow the church. Um, you put all your value into how well the church is performing. And we'd have these like meetings, you know, periodically where we'd have to present and explain ourselves about how many studies did we have? How many fruit? How many, like, what's the status of the new fruit? Um, you know, where people are preaching and just go through the details of the house and is it successful? And I felt like pretty well equipped because, you know, I worked in like a corporate job where you can show, um, you know, how things are and how things are progressing, you know, through like a slideshow and explain data. And that's what it was. It was just like a job. Um, you get up and, and you do like a PowerPoint presentation and you have cool slides. Tony showed me those. You showed me those of your house church stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mine weren't really like the best looking slideshows. <laughs> but well, so you don't really have time because you're preaching, you're cooking, you're cleaning, mm -hmm. you're preparing sermons, and you're you're working and you're taking care of members, you're having meetings, all that stuff. Yeah. But honestly, that was probably like one of my favorite times is because, you know, you really get to like, you have people over and you just kind of host them. Um, I found like a big passion in like making coffee and, you know, cooking and like helping out in that regard. And just like having people over for me, that was like, 
all right, entertainment. Like, you know, you're going to come do a Bible study, like welcome. And when you guys talk about these parts of it, I get jealous and like, uh, not jealous. I, I can totally get it. Like, it sounds so fun. You live in a big house with all your buddies. You guys all believe in the same thing. It sounds fun. I could totally see why that aspect of it is so appealing and like uh, makes you feel like you're doing the right thing because you're living with your friends and you're doing it together. You're in a community. Yeah, yeah and, that and community and aspect is really cool. I do. Yeah. I can't. The, see. I like the fact that like you could basically just meet a member who you've never met before and instantly know that this person's like not going to be like, you know, rude to you or like, you know, they've already been vetted, you yeah. know, like they've already gone through like this whole or sister. Yeah. So you, like the you guys connect like yeah. you, you, there's no fear. There's no like because you feel very comfortable with anyone who's a legit member. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you trust them immediately. Right. So like having people over to the, you know, the house was, you know, we had some problems with the neighbors. Um, I ended up joining a Facebook group for the neighborhood and already, like I guess I saw someone say like, I think it's a cult. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the reason the- is, is because like members, there's so many members and there's probably not enough parking, right? Oh, well, parking. For- yeah. They right. So, so people would, right. And the le- yeah. the long hours probably. Yeah, leaving in the middle of the night. And then also yeah, the yeah. way that they would drive. Like sometimes like they would drive really fast down a small residential street and they'd complain about that too. It was like they take pictures of people's cars. Oh, and then they'd, wow. they'd be like, I don't like the way this person parked. And they'd like, you know, they'd send it online. So that was like I had to try to like team that. And I contacted neighbors. I'd get them like restaurant gift cards to hush them up and ask them to take it down. <laughs> um, like I, I, I tried uh, to really keep the peace, but ultimately, um, after a while, I just, you know, I got into the theological school. Um, I became a deacon, um, which I didn't expect. You know, one day the general pastor was there, and it was like, okay, you know, this list of people just stay after service. Is that theological school in North in South Korea? Um, so there is one in South Korea. Um, I believe it's at the the Go and Come Institute, but the they basically just give you like packets here, and okay. you just yeah you tell them what you did every day, and you mark it down, and then you have to do like studies, and you have to write your own sermons based on the readings. Um, Tony, it, did you do that? That's like the different trainings. It seems yeah. like each each area sort of had their own training, like camps, yeah. disciple training, um, something like that. Yeah. Sorry. Do you remember it, Raymond talking about, I was it Raymond that was talking about, um, well, it was one of our previous guests talking about um, the disciple camps, which I know that we had here too. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was trying to, sorry. I knew there was one in South Korea, like on the main campus. Right. I didn't know if yeah. you like went to South Korea to do this study or if it was. Oh, yeah. No, I, I went to South Korea one time, um, but it wasn't with a visiting group. Um, that was the one perk of having a, um, not, not, I can't say one perk, you know, but I had a perk of having a Korean uh, wife. Oh, so, you got to go like visit her actual family and stuff? Yeah, that's what we would say. Um, <laughs> that's what we were <laughs> but we really went there for church activities is the primary thing that we, uh, we went over there for, but we would see the family and spend time with them, but it was really more about like, was her family in the church? No, nobody. Um, her oh mom, my God. So they must've thought that was strange that she's coming home with an American husband. Yes. And they tried to like have me drink. Um, I think it's called soju, something like that. There's like a Korean it's almost like a Korean sake. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, they're like, oh, he's just saying no because of you. And, you know, like mm-hmm. they, they would talk about her. They talked about her a lot, but she wouldn't translate for me what they were saying. Oh. So maybe they're talking about me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is what so- an interesting trip. Oh, my gosh. That must I didn't even think about that. About asking if her family was in it. Yeah, yeah no, her, her, her family isn't in it. She um, she's the only one who was a Christian. Um, in her family, 
and you know she was going to a sunday church but as soon as she heard about the sabbath day she was just all about it mm. um and she's extremely extremely like uh faithful to this belief system mm-hmm. um you know as you know as the everybody struggles and things like that in different ways but i mean her faith in this is really really strong um and it's like extremist strong. It's like very, it's, very strong. It's con- maybe conditional to her existing in the US still or no? You know what? I would say that um there is there is a, a a a lot of that where people when you get separated from your family, when you get separated from your worldly support system, um, it's very hard to think about anything else. Like your new family is the church they're everything. They're your only friends, the only confidants. They're the only ones that you have around. Everybody else has been cut out. Like, you know, physically I was relocated to different places. Um, so I can't go visit my family like when I want to. I have to make like a special trip with time off of work, time out of the church. Uh, they can't visit me whenever they want either. It's just like I felt very like distant and separated um and that happens to a lot of people like i have i don't have anyone here like i left the church and i'm here alone um and it was one of the most difficult things for me is the fact that i'm going from having like all these people to talk to and all these like you know you go through a lot with these people like you know it's like war buddies you know like you preach together you know you fast together that's a great way to think of it war buddies you know, it, it, all these yeah. awful things you have to endure awful together things. and mm-hmm. you do it together and you survive it together and you're bonded. And then all of a sudden, if you leave, you walk away from every single one of them. Like they won't talk to you. And they're supposed to be the ones who are like, you know, you know, uh, uh, eternal love. This is supposed to be the ones who, you know, unconditional, but it really is a lot of conditions. You, you literally know. talk about spending eternity together. You're like, when we're in heaven, we're going to do this. Like you visualize spending eternity with them forever. Yeah. And, and then you, and then it's just get along with them. Yeah. And so in the same way, um, for somebody to leave a whole country to go to a new country, right. you could only imagine that they probably have that same sort of pressure, but magnified that right. where else can they go? What are they going to do? I, I, I don't think that she even has that thought, but. So Anthony, after all of this, like now you and your wife have been married for a while. Yes. And it started off like very like stranger meeting stranger. After all of that time, did it ever develop into like a love relationship or was it always just kind of this work church relationship? Like did that ever evolve into a better connected relationship or was it? Well, I'll say from the very beginning, although there was a lot of conflict, it was constant, constant conflict for the first couple of years. Yeah, it was um, a lot of arguing, um, not seeing eye to eye. And, you know, you could blame a lot of it on, on cultural things, but also it's like, let's get down to it. It's really about, you know, people. <laughs> um, yeah. So th- there was a lot of incompatibilities, um, but throughout the entire thing uh, as a person, uh, you know, from like uh, member to member, you know, there was a lot of love like that. Yeah. And eventually as we were together and we worked together, you know, it definitely blossomed into something else. Like it was more than just, oh, like, um, you know, let's just do the mission together. You know, we really, really tried to become a, a actual couple. Yeah. In the reality, it's not the love story. It's not um, it's not a way to really come together. And we never really connected like that. I mean, if people do, if people are arranged and then they fall like deeply in love. But that does happen. Like, right. We yeah. actually know somebody that that happened but, with. Exactly. It's so fascinating. So, it's, that's beautiful. But I I feel like my, you know. When I felt like the world was ending, it was fine. Yeah. But after a while, like I didn't really 
feel like that was my uh the person I should be with um you know and and it's it's really difficult because like even though even after I had left uh we tried for a, a little bit of time but it was just so incompatible um I just realized really quickly that you know even though it was really difficult to leave this uh you know, foundation in my life, this like really strong bond and this person who was constantly there and, you know, cooking meals and like we cleaned the house together and, you know, you know, oh, I'm going to buy you a gift or things like that. Like now all of a sudden, you know, when you realize that the whole bond was because you were doing the gospel work together, or I say gospel, but, you know, I don't think it's actually, you know, the gospel but that's right. what they call it. So I'll use that term. <clears throat> right. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it turns out it's not really true love. And now that like I'm living my real life, that's something I'd, I'd want to find. But, yeah, you know, and, you know, I don't know like what, what, you know, everyone's future is or anything like that. But like I was saying, it's very difficult for us in our lives being separated from family and everything like that, like all these bonds that we have with the members and, you know, whoever you're arranged to, these are like all you have. So they become even more precious. Right. And then I even think about like the overseers and their lives. And, you know, these people, they live at the church, their cars to the church, their insurance, everything, you know, and when they are there, you know, every member will like, they say jump, everyone says how high. It's, they get all this respect. All these people will do whatever they say. They, you know, they never are going to lose an argument because they're always right because they're basically pointed told, by God. Yeah. So <laughs> if you disagree with me, you disagree agree with God. Right. So they have this sort of power. So even if they realize that this church is teaching falsehood, well, what are they going to do? Right. You know, they're going to lose their home. They're going to lose everything. They have this giant gap on their resume, no applicable skills. What are they going to do? Go back to the world and like work in middle management or, you know, entry level. Like, what are they supposed to do with their lives? You know, every, like the members are paying for everything for them and the members are serving them like they're God themselves. You is know? an overseer above or is an overseer right below a pastor? An overseer so, is a pastor. It could uh, be a pastor. Okay. Okay. There's sometimes an overseer that's a missionary or an elder. Mm -hmm. Um. So the I, I think uh, Lindsay, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with like the tiers and rankings. Everybody comes in as a brother or sister. Okay. And then the next level up by title is um, a deacon or deaconess, and then after that is missionary, and then after that is elder for the men, uh, for women, I believe the title is Kwansanim, which I don't know what the English translation would be. I think like I was told that it just means pastor wife, but I don't know. I'm just going to say there, I've heard that before. And I thought it was a, a spe one specific woman's name in no. the church. Yeah. That's her title. That's so funny. I thought that was her name. No, that's well, yeah. A lot of times the Quonset names you don't even know what their name is. Yeah, you just well, call them Quonset name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's it's it. like the highest respect of a woman that Ooh, a woman that's can have. This episode's mind blown of me. Yeah, because I thought that Quonset name was one lady who was in Denver, and that was her name. No, Mulk's name is Pastor, and then <laughs> Quonset name is. <laughs> and then a, above later. that is the pastor. So that's just on title, but then there's position. So you could be like um, a uh, team leader and then you could be a group leader and then you could be a church leader and then above that is an overseer who will look after a region of churches so they all have their own which is usually like what they call a temple which is like the big building but then there'll be all the different branches off of it so sometimes there are offices or houses and they all in a region will report to that one overseer so there's different territories and like sections that they divide the map into where an overseer who's maybe a missionary or an elder or a pastor will look after. So, you know, and a lot of times they even get like um, 
you know, instantly they get positions in like the nonprofit organization associated with the church uh, called the We Love You Foundation, um, which is their way to kind of sneakily get into um, places that look into the church or don't want any like religious organizations volunteering for them. So, you know, they do um, some like charitable work, but it's their way to kind of network. Right. And then um, there's another one, right? Isn't there like a newer one? So, uh, yes. So, so there, there's another one. It's called, uh, oh. I, I, ASEZ? Is it ASEZ? Yeah. ASEZ? I, I, yeah. I want to pronounce it the way that it looks like it should be pronounced. Pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, so asses. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, is there other organization? What do they call it though? How do you pronounce it in real life? Oh, there I've heard a thousand different ways because I've only seen you, it written A S E Z. Yeah, they they um I've heard A says A says like it depends like you know I hear different um news clip interviews from different regions and everybody does it differently because um, everybody's like how do we say this without saying asses? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It That's was funny. not well planned. It was not well planned. No, so this is like they're preaching, um, like how they preach on campuses, right? Um, so, or they, is this introduce it through like a, as a volunteer organization? Oh, volunteering. Okay. So yeah, it's um supposed to be like college age kids volunteering. So they use that guys as like, oh, look at these young people getting involved. Meanwhile, like you look at a video and there's like forty year olds. Like, yeah. you know, you're not in school. <laughs> I'm not in school. I'm a link to the Yale uh, article on this episode, too. So people can read what, like, what they're up to. What it's actually really, like. How it's yeah. connected with the church and what they're actually really doing on college campuses. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, you know, like, who can say anything against, like, volunteerism? Volunteerism is great. As long as your goal is volunteerism. Right. But if you're doing it for something else, like, you know, like you, they're volunteering to like clean a park, but, you know, really like, well, this park's about to burn up in flames because, you know, the end is near. Right. So who, who really cares if it's clean? Right. Who cares about the ozone layer or whatever? Because That's their genuine, genuine feeling. They don't care yeah. because the end they is coming. Care. They're just doing it. Can I ask, were you there when the Queen's Award was given? Uh, yes, uh, the Queen's Award, um, and I was there too, and at the very beginning, yes, I did hear that it was the only religious organization, like, um, you know, they kind of tried to, like, you know, sweep that claim under the rug, but I even saw, like, a YouTube clip where, like, another organization from the church went on the news, and they said, we're the only religious organization to receive this, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you, as a member, it felt like the coolest thing in the world. Mm. I remember um, like the way I would use the Queen's Award would be like, oh, somebody, you know, said something bad about my church. Oh, well, you know, the Queen thinks it's, you know, a good church because she gave us an award. So who am I going to believe? Like Nancy working retail or am I going to believe the Queen of England? So like that was like, <laughs> that was my smug way. It to gave you feel. like it gave you like a justification or you know like kind of like a power like if yeah. the queen but if the queen you know thinks that we're great then we must really be great. And did you guys use the queen's award for preaching? Like when you yeah, were out preaching, validate. were you? I could see how that would validate your guys's position. Where like the queen, even the queen thinks we're great. Yeah. Um. I I honestly didn't use that. That was more of like when we would do a tour of the church. You know, they had a whole room dedicated to like different um, like awards and things like that that they would ask people. So we had a whole room that we would walk into and be like, oh, look at all these awards. And that was kind of like a great prop um, for us to be able to point to and explain. But yeah, I mean, Maybe if somebody had any sort of doubt about the credibility of the church, um, that would be like a great way for me to, you know, talk about it. But um, at first it was just really exciting and it felt like, wow, like the kings of the earth are coming to bow before Jerusalem. And, you know, but really it's just like a lot of people get that every year from what I heard, you know, like 
Prop- you know, but <laughs> it's great. It's propaganda. I was just yeah. thinking that. I was just thinking that prop. You know, it's just prop it's just all for show. Yeah. Yeah, it's really like a lot of the things that they do are just for the image. Like they just want to look legit. And but it works. Actually, the reason they want to do it is because it works. I mean, that's this has been a tactic since like the Moonies. Right. Like even the, the Moonies would go to the presidents and you know, they would try to get these officials to like legitimize I think they still do their organizations. Yeah. Right, right. Um so you know. In my timeline. Well, uh, we just talked about it with Mike Kaufman, right? Yeah. Right. And the last episode is about Mike Kaufman did some charity work with the Denver church. Right. Like not knowing. Not knowing. They just did this like cleanup and they don't even know they're doing it. They're not even connecting that they're working with this church. Yeah. That's actually like a lot of people, they don't really realize through the mm-hmm. different organizations that come up to them because they just hear, oh, volunteers, they want to do something. They're with like a, a religious organization. You know, I think a lot of them, they can't get, you know, a lot of different people because people do do some research. But um, some people, maybe maybe they do their research and they just don't care. Or maybe or they, just they do, do their, their research on and... World Mission Society and then asses comes up and they're like, <laughs> no, who asses is? Look at all their great volunteer work. I mean, <laughs> if you, they do have, have a lot of propaganda. They, they, yeah, there's definitely a lot of like good imaging and videos and things like that. Yeah. I used mm-hmm. to love the Hurricane Sandy video to show that mm-hmm. to people. It was like an mm-hmm. hour long, mm-hmm. but like, like you know, they put in like some worldly music. They had like some like you know really sad um, <laughs> interviews with people. Some a lot of devastation. Then they had some inspiring music mm-hmm. when like members are cleaning up. But uh, yeah, the propaganda department is very strong. Um, and I didn't really realize that that's what it was until you could see the big impact that these videos make on the mindset of the members and, you know, how these things are used in order to kind of keep them thinking like this is much bigger than it actually is. Um, You look forward to the videos. You're like, is there a new video? Is there new news from Korea? Is there new news from, from like, we would always want to see New York videos. We'd love to see the videos from, from you guys because it would like give us quote unquote inspiration. But I think it really just gave, you know, more competition. Like, you know, we wanted to be better than you guys. Yeah. There was always a competition, even like Denver did something really big and they had like a ton of baptisms and all the, the um, one, you know, pastor uh, could say mm-hmm. was, oh, yeah, you know, very good for them. They had a lot of baptisms, but they have a very small church. I'm not sure where they're going to put all those people. Oh. So anyway. <laughs> That's funny because then we bought a bigger church. <laughs> Are we just talking about this guy? We're thinking yeah. of adding a new segment of a ding dong. Um, <laughs> stories stories that we can share because a lot of people yeah. share with us you know different different stories that we hear and we're shocked you know some of the the things that are happening over there um and so we would like to share anonymously some stories about that you know along our way so look out for that you guys oh yeah, yeah that it's sounds... gonna be pretty interesting <laughs> okay so now you are in you're in baltimore right yes Okay, yes. so you're in Baltimore and everything is good and you, you know, everything. Yeah, I, I became a, um, a deacon. I was a church leader. I was in the theological school. I began a work mission. Um, you know, I everything was going really, really well. 2020 hit. Um, COVID. Um, mm. Lockdown. Uh, I still kept my job. Everything financially was fine. Um, it was unique trying to adapt to, you know, this new environment. And we had a lot of Zoom, a lot of like, you know, preaching and meetings. And it was just like consistently we were um, online sitting at our computers. I was reading uh, the books that were written by the leader of the I don't want to say truth books because I don't yeah. really, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I don't really think that that the would propaganda be propaganda books. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, were you communally living at the time during COVID? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were all extremely cautious. I would say that after the Shinchunji church 
had mm. that big outbreak. Yeah. Um, the Church of God was like getting kind of lumped up with them. You yeah. know, and people were like, oh, watch out for churches like this. Mm-hmm. And the Church of God, they were very, very cautious for the most part about um, the way that we would have to wear our masks. They, they would spray us down, at least in my area, with uh, chemicals before we'd walk into the church. <laughs> Um, what kind like, of chemicals? You know, well, it wasn't a big jug. I'm not really sure exactly what it was, but I think it was some sort of disinfectant. Okay. And, uh, Which is like, and, so like mind boggling because I'm like good on them and also like what repercussions? Like, it could be anything, really. There were caps of how many people could gather. So what we would do is like we would park at like um, the mall or the Walmart and we would get shuttled in. And we'd have to like wait for no one to look and then they all run in. Um, so there there was some good with the bad. Um, yeah, but you guys are probably still wearing masks and stuff and like trying. I mean, I'm sure that they didn't want an outbreak. That wasn't, you know. No, yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. And there there was, you know, some. But stuff they needed to happened. keep the Sabbath day. Um, but 2020 also gave us a little bit more free time. Um, and I started to talk to my sister more. Um, you know, she was going through a tough time in her life. Uh, she ended up uh, having to relocate to a town she hated um, to do like a work project there. And she felt very isolated and it was very difficult for her. So I'm like, I need to talk to her. And, you know, we started talking more and more. And after that, I started to kind of feel a little bit more like my old self a little bit, like a little bit of that was coming up. Um, so that was definitely like, I felt the need as one I had, I was just approaching, um, in 2021, I was going to hit my 10 year mark and I've, I was feeling older, you know, I'm, I, I'm in my mid thirties, no kids, um, you know, and I, I, you know, it's just like, I, I was reflecting on my life and family became really important to me. Um, through COVID, I really I realized that, you know, you know, I was able to speak to both of my sisters more and just kind of like rebuild a relationship. And it felt really, really good. And during that time too, my aunt actually had um, got diagnosed with cancer, like terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. And when she died, I found out the news at 5 a.m. for a 5 a.m. worship during a feast. And I, um, right after service, I told my wife, um, and the response was, oh, you know what this reminds me of? The verse that says, let the dead bury their own dead. Mm. So mm-hmm. what, what that means, uh, Lindsay, because uh, you seem like <laughs> uh, that means there are people who are alive and people who are dead. Um, so physically we're alive. But then spiritually, it depends on like your spirit, whether your spirit received life or not. So everyone in the world, you'd call them dead. So let the people who are outside of the church worry about dead people, because that's not our worry. That was basically the sentiment of that statement. Mm. Um, Like the meanest thing you say in that moment. (laughs) Yeah. And yeah. And then when I I brought it up, like, like, how could you... How is that your like you know your sympathy? Is that like mm-hmm. how you're gonna react to to this situation? And it was like a, a little bit of a backtrack. Oh, I didn't understand. Mm. Well, then if you didn't understand, like that verse wouldn't really come to mind, would it? That's their but, genuine feeling, though. Like that's really yeah. how they feel. Like yeah. that's their I reality, thought, you, know, you know. Yeah. Honestly, like you know what? Maybe it wouldn't have hit me. Um, if I hadn't already kind of softened my heart to my family through talking to my sister and getting more involved, because there was a time where I did lose a family member, like back in like 2014 and nobody told me. And Mm -hmm. they're like, I was like, wait, you know, he died. And they're like, Oh yeah, we didn't tell you because we just didn't think you'd care. And I was like, Oh, and they're like, you know, his, his funeral was last Saturday. I'm like, Oh yeah, I wouldn't have gone um so you know it was it was definitely a transition in 2020 for me emotionally um and then I also had a uh a really interesting bible study with somebody online who was 
well versed in the Bible. And I never really met somebody who can pick apart the points. Like, um, you like know, you were the Bible teacher and they were the listener or? Yeah. Yeah. I was okay. teaching the Bible to somebody through okay. a Zoom call. And really like all the things that I had in my mind on some of these lessons that I um, I had doubt about, mm. like he brought them up and I'm like, oh, I can't even like, I always hope nobody would say anything about that. Mm. Like um, wow. Apostle Paul on the Sabbath day, like where would he be? They'd find him always in a synagogue and what would he be doing? He'd be preaching. If Apostle Paul was at these locations establishing churches why wasn't he at church on the Sabbath day? Why was he going to these synagogues to preach to people? Like, shouldn't he have been at the house church or whatever church he just established? Right. So right. like, they brought up, like, you know, he brought up these different points and he showed me like through Bible, like a perspective I hadn't seen before. And it was also supported in scripture. I'm mm -hmm. like, I didn't know anyone else could do that. You know, I didn't know anyone else had a point besides the points that I've been fed. Right. Right. So, that for me was kind of like, you know what, maybe I don't have all the answers. Um, and little by little, there were all these different things that started to come to mind. And one thing was um, there was a change of the overseer and they put in this real villain, um, this real like awful person um, who like I had a bad impression of him from the beginning because of how he would talk about members behind their backs. Um, you know, one member, he asked a question about, um, you know, a, a, a particular teaching and he's like, oh, you know what, I, to, just like the leaders later, I, um, I thought that that member had better faith, you know, but he asked a question, you know, like this, you know, so why is he questioning, you know, and that was the kind of mindset. And then some other people who were there, like he, he would say, um, I don't know why the pastor ever let this one become a leader. You know, they're fake leaders. You know, the pastor made a mistake letting them become like, and just like the way he would bash people and he would try to put on like a smiley front to everybody. But in reality, he was really, really like harshly speaking about people. And it really turned me off to, I'm like, how could this be like God's chosen person? but he's doing all these really awful things and saying all these terrible things about people. Right. Um, we had a lot of different like disputes between us. And I, um, that was like one part of me wants to look at him. Like, I don't like you because you're a bad person. But another part of me is kind of like, well, you're kind of a catalyst that made me rethink my position. Right. And one, yeah. So, um, I started to see different things like on research, not research about the church, but just research in general. Um, I thought I would use sort of this COVID time to do a little bit of homework. Um, like I looked into um, what is a cult? What are cults? You know, and I'd, I'd hear videos talking about why Mormonism or Jehovah Witnesses are cults. I would look into um, the Scientology thing that, um, what was her name? Leah Remini. Leah Remini, yeah. Yeah, she um she had something out and I listened to those. And eventually, like I listened to this um uh defactor from North Korea, and she was giving this testimony about her life in North Korea. And she said that, you know, there the way that they would have propaganda videos given to them, the way that they viewed their leader in the um she's like we were told that even though we're starving he's starving even more than we are and that he could read our thoughts and she's like it wasn't until after i left north korea that i realized that he was fat like and, you know and it just reminded me so much of how we're told like every 5 a.m you know this woman she wakes up and she gets down on her you know injured knees and She's wearing all makeup and she's doing all this stuff and she's always working and she's sleeping when she's like up at the altar because she's burning up inside. And, you know, you believe all these things because just like the North Koreans believe it, it I think it's just like part of this like culture where they really believe this person can read their mind. This person is able to, 
um, like starve so much and they sacrifice so much for you. And they use a lot of, there, there's no word for love except the love of the country or love of the leader. Like that's how North Korea is. And it made me realize like, wow, this propaganda and the, this brainwashing really exists. There's a whole country of people living their life looking at Kim Jong-un the way I'm looking at, you know, these uh, two individuals. Right. Well, that was kind of uh, an eye opener. That's shocking. That woman's name is, I think you're talking about Yonmi Park. Yonmi Park. Yes. She uh, did an interview with Joe Rogan that I watched um, and listened to. But I encourage everybody to hear her story because that is so, so powerful. Her story and what you said, you know. Um, the other thing I did was I started to look into history more. The church teaches like this is what happened in history. Well, I started to look into it. I'm like, oh, I want to be able to speak more clearly about this. So I started to research the dates and the things that they claimed that had happened. And I started to realize dates didn't always match up with what they were teaching. So like um, they, they taught one about Daniel's prophecy about the fall of Ostrogoths. Not true. They taught one about the Millerite movement. They say it had to be for 10 years because that fulfills a 10 day feast. But it was actually for like 13 years. So a lot of things didn't match up. And whenever I found their sources that said that it did, I would dig into who's the author. And a lot of times it might be like a pastor of a Seventh-day Adventist church, or like they would use very selective um, people. And even um, like uh, if you research like Polycarp, who they might use to talk about the history of either the Sabbath or the Passover, um, I believe for the Sabbath day, you read his like history and what he wrote in full context. And he talked about Easter and celebrating Easter and things like that. But you use him to support one thing, but he's actually disagreeing with you on other things. Um, you know, I, I just did more and more research. And then I started to listen to um, the Shin Chun Ji put on uh, sermons online on YouTube. And I'm like, wow, like the Church of God's like, who can teach like this? Who has teachings like this? Like, oh, Shin actually, Chun like, Chun <laughs> and then like, I also watched, they have videos of this like old man doing um, unification church teachings. I started watching those and I'm like, oh, you know, same thing. You know, they believe in the male and the female image. And I started to realize, and I started, uh, I contacted a um, Mormon and I asked them to teach me. And I started to study with the Mormons. And here are some of the stuff that they believe. And before long, I started to realize, wow, like all these people really believe what they're teaching and they can support it just as well as I can with my church. Like I'm no smarter or better than anyone else. And the same thing, like all around, there are all these different churches that manipulate the scripture in the same sort of way. Using even, even using the same verse. Even, Even using, using the same Bible verse, and they're like creating a whole different doctrine around it, but it's still so believable. Anthony, did you enjoy the Book of Mormon, or was it offensive? Oh, uh, the musical. Yeah. Or the the study. Or the, the, the musical. The musical. Okay, most of it was like really funny and enjoyable, but there were some parts that felt like I felt targeted. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. hey, that 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 was me. <laughs> yeah, was it the uh, like? It, it was way about? too relatable. Yeah. The one that really got me there was one about like when you're upset, like um, um, turn it off. Turn like it off switch. like a light bulb. Just go click. <laughs> yeah, trick. because that one reminded me of like a lesson. Because like as, as I was um, I was thinking, okay, at the very beginning when I first came, it was like keep the Passover. But now you also need to keep the Sabbath day and three services. And then you need to keep third day because, like, you know, you need to be fully cleansed. And then you need to tithe. And then you need to keep the feasts. And, like, it's not just seven. Like, you know, throw in, like, the, the uh, tabernacle. birthday. Yeah. And then you throw in the birthdays and you throw in um, the uh, ascension day. And then you talk about, like, um, the, you know, the, you know, he died on this day and before long, like, you have a very full calendar. Like, you have no vacation days to visit people because, like, it's all used up throughout the, you know, the year going to these different feasts. Uh, so it it gets, like, really, like, there's a lot of different things that they make you do. But then it's, like, not just that. Okay, now you need to also do preparation. 
like preparation day is really important. Yeah, like we're spiritually in preparation day because the the Sabbath of like a thousand years is coming. And, you know, this is a time for you to get your blessings and, you know, do all this stuff. And preparation day is such an important part. And you need to preach and you need to bear fruit. And then they get into like, you know, so already like, you know, I thought I just had to keep the Passover. And now it's like this laundry list of things you need to do. And then they give teachings like this. Uh, if we want to go to the kingdom of heaven, we have to have manners. Can you imagine going to heaven and people don't have manners? Well, what are manners? Well, you need to smile. Smiling is good manners. So if you don't smile, then you don't have good manners. And if you don't have good manners, where are you not going to go? You're not going to go to heaven because you're not smiling. Man, you're so, doing, you're pulling out that preaching talk so <laughs> good right now. <laughs> well, I've been I mean, Bible study right now. Are you telling yeah, me? Like, <laughs> you, bow, you have to bow, you know, like it's not Korean culture. It's God's culture. You know, God chose this land for a reason. And like they, they would give you all like this. And it just felt like, okay, if I didn't do all these other things, now I have to do. Like I have to smile all the time. I I can't get upset. You push I, you know, those feelings down. Yeah. I can lie. Like, so just go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel like that though. So eventually, I started to really do like a lot, of, you know, other questioning and research, and I really discovered that okay, this is just a cult. This that's all it is. Like that. This is what it is. Every single teaching that they had. When I did further research into it, it was actually very flawed. Um, there was nothing substantial. And then I did research into like the early church days. There's like the Didache and like all these other early church writers who taught things in direct opposition to what this church is teaching. And even like they talk about, oh, our brothers and sisters, they died in the catacombs. They were a person. Well, you look at the catacombs. Look what they look like. They all look like a Catholic church. They have all these paintings and images and crosses and like the halos around the heads that's what the catacombs look like where we teach that was our brothers and sisters well our brothers and sisters must have fell into idolatry pretty early because that's what they were doing but they were because people didn't read so they put up all these paintings mm. so more and more i started to research and more and more i discovered that this church was not true and then it became like time of decision how am i going to leave like I felt so when you felt that moment of like, oh my God, I'm in a quote unquote cult, which I don't know, maybe that was hard for you, but what did that what did that feel like for you? I want to know like what does it feel like when when you realize that? Um, like, is that were, you know, can you express it, it? It okay, it happens in a little bit of phases because at the very beginning you want to, you know, you still want to protect it a little bit and you still want to be like super respectful. You, you know, your, your, um, your mind has been built in order to look at, you know, this uh, lady in Korea as like the most holy. So you feel like very, very strange having any sort of criticism about that. And you want to be like, okay, you know, she's still cool, you know, <laughs> but every right. time, in a way you kind of realize, and even early on, they would be like, well, even if we are a cult, well, at least we're a cult that goes to heaven. And my thing is, like, they would deny all these cult experts. So I'm like, but, you know, cults do exist, though, right? Like, we're not just saying, like, oh, cults are okay. Like, we're saying that our church is okay, right? And, like, mm -hmm. you never really, <laughs> you don't want to question because questioning gets you um, ostracized. But, um, you know, it was always a little bit strange about the concept of a cult. But I um it it's always in the back of your mind. It's always in the back of your mind. Like, what if you know this is a cult or at least has cult you know tendency tendencies? But that's how I um I would describe it, you know, based on my experience, is that's what this you know this organization is. And you know, I I had some time of really like not knowing what to do. Um, I was so miserable in that one location. I think part of it happened because obviously the most part was because of that new leader. But eventually, like, that led me to do all this research and have all this doubt. I was just trying to leave wherever I could go. I was just trying to get out of that location. And I moved one state over. 
And as soon as I did, um, every single person that I knew over there wouldn't talk to me. Mm. Like nobody would respond to text or anything like that. Everyone just like shut me out. And I was still in the church and I was still like going, I was still like faithfully going uh, every single like service, but they just like cut me out. I'm like, okay, you know what? This also feels like um, shunning. This also feels like you know, fake. I, I, I kind of realized how the people really were. I didn't learn the lesson in 2013. I was learning it like for real this time. The first time around, I guess I, you know, overlooked it, but now I finally was like, okay, this is not really people who care. These are people who will turn their back the moment they're told to. And they're just under like the authority. They're just puppets on a string um, because that's how the cult is designed, you know, that's how they're designed to be. And I don't hold it against them. Um, you know, I miss some of them, but now I don't. Now I, I kind of moved on um, <laughs> since then. Um, you know, I hope that they all do well. I don't wish anything like bad on anybody. And I hope that they can also kind of realize about what this organization truly is. But I, um, I'm, yeah, I just, I decided one day, like, I need to leave. And I called, um, I called a friend and I sat in the, in my car on a third day in the parking lot of the church. And I'm like, I don't think I could go in. Like, I, I, am I going to go in? I'm not going to go in. I did that like two, three times before. And I always went in. And then one day I was just like, drive away, just drive. And I just drove through and um there was thankfully like um somebody i knew who had left um the church as well and i called her up and uh you know we had a conversation i'm like i'm doing it i'm skipping the third day <laughs> i'm not gonna do it i'm not gonna go and it was like you know and then i just basically i told you know i told my wife because on third day she would um she'd go to a different location closer to work and it was kind of like, you know what? I'm not going to ever go back. And nobody ever spoke to me after that. Um, so devastating. Yeah. So after that, me and my wife, we try to work things out. And like, okay, I don't go to the church, but maybe we could be together. But um, every, every day, basically, she was gone. I was just sitting home alone. I had nothing to do. I'd, you know, I'd go to the gym or I'd go to the park on Sunday, you know, just walk around. And um, I had nothing to do. I had nobody to talk to. Um, I had no friends. And she was like, well, you know, and I also want to let you know, I don't want to be married to anybody who drinks. And I don't want to be married to anybody who smokes. And like, and I'm not looking to do any of these things anyway. Mm -hmm. But I should have the freedom. Mm -hmm. I might as well be in the church, you know. Yeah, and mm -hmm. all this time alone, I'm just like, okay, it's not going to work. And, you know, the lease was coming to an end. So I just, I moved out and, you know, I just decided, okay, you know, I need to start my life fresh. I need to just live my life and live for me now because yeah. the, the church isn't, the, it was, you know, you have this beautiful promise in mind and you really hope that it's true, but yeah it's empty. It's a lie. It's just, you know, they want your money. They want your time. They want your labor. Um, and they'll use you up, burn you out and discard you like you were nothing. So that's. What month was that? What month was it that you moved out? Um, so it was December when I stopped going. And then it was in January that I moved out, like early January, like uh, at the very, very beginning of the month. Or 2022. 2022. Wow. Yeah. So it's all, you know. Fresh. Yeah. But like so, so good on you because you were in the most complicated of circumstances. I was really lucky to fa find a community too in that little bit of time from December. I mean, I, you know, you guys started your podcast. Yeah. Um, I reached out like after the first episode or something like that. Oh, that's so that's that's, that's so fun. fascinating because we started the podcast like for our 10 family members. 
Right. Well, I spoke to somebody else too, um, who told me that your podcast was coming and to listen out for it. And, you know, it's been like, there's like a little community um, yeah. of like, you know, cause you guys, you know, you had some of those other ex members on and um, I had the, the, that kind of support and yeah. my family. And as soon as I left uh, my wife, I basically made this big confessional like post on my Facebook. Um, and I basically was like a tell all of, Hey guys, I've been in a cult and I just left my wife and I was married to her through the cult. And I, I told like everything, everything. And I'm like, now I'm like in a hotel and I'm just trying to get like, you know, my life together again. And I'm sorry, I haven't been there for weddings and birthdays and, births and all this stuff but you know I was in a very high demand group and I just I couldn't you know it was it was you know that kind of post and a lot of people came to my support a lot of support came my way and I was you know I I didn't know who would be responsive and some people I didn't expect some people like I hadn't spoke to since high school all of a sudden came out of the woodwork um, you know, people I hadn't been in touch with, uh, all of a sudden I had this really beautiful support group. And of course, like my sisters were always there for me and calling and, um, you know, making sure I was okay. And like, even though they had some problems of their own that they're dealing with, like they would just focus on like, you know, how are you, how are you, you know, what's, what's your situation like? And, um, you know, after that, I just kind of started to, to network and things like that, it's not easy. It's really not easy leaving because there's not a lot of stuff to go through, but that pain, it's only for a little while, you know, yeah. like you get the real people back. Right. Yeah. I would, um, how would you express like that immediate pain? I just want to maybe see if you can express that of it's, leaving, like, I can't like imagine. that fear. <clears throat> okay. Well, for, for a while, like they built, you have a reality, a sense of reality, and they basically train your brain to see that true reality as false. And they build a new reality for you. And in this new reality, you know, they teach you that, okay, yeah, you have a physical brother and sister. Well, they're spiritual brothers and sisters. And that love is so much better and greater because it's eternal. The flesh it's only for now. And then, you know, same thing with your parents, your parents love you, but their love for you is nothing compared to the love of God. And, you know, they, they, you know, you can learn a lesson from the physical, but the spiritual is really where all the value is. So you feel like you have the most valuable thing in the whole world. And it's this beautiful concept, this beautiful idea of like, you know, something about outer space and having a star. And I don't even know what that meant, but I just knew that I, like, I wanted it. Wanted it. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I want to start, like, stars, there's a big ball of gas. For sure. Like, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they, they give you this, this, this beautiful concept. And then all of a sudden you realize the promise is false. The teachings are false. And, you know, these people, like, they're your everything. You know, you've, and just to leave and to have like, who, what am I going to do with my time? You know, even still today, I, I'm struggling because um, I am so used to having activities every single day and not resting that I can't feel comfortable just coming home and watching TV. Like I, every day I need to go out yeah. and I can't sleep at a normal hour still because I'm just so accustomed to staying up so late that, you know, it's just um, re, re uh, introducing myself to like a normal lifestyle. Like there are certain things that have just been so skewed for a long time that it's taken me a while to realize what's normal, what's not normal. And, um, you know, coming out and figuring out life for a second time, it, you know, like I, it's still so strange because I feel like 10 years are just like missing like i'm coming back out and you know i don't know like really how to interact with people i don't really know like i just tell people i'm like yeah i was in a religious cult for 10 years and you know there are some things that i just don't know <laughs> you know right. like 
Did you experience nightmares? You do talk about like it was hard to sleep, um, you know, find a regular sleep schedule. I had nightmares in 2011 before the, you know, in 2012 that like about like uh, New York City, um, like buildings crumbling and all these crazy things happening and the world coming to an end and not knowing where to run to and, um, you know, just that kind of uh image um i had a weird dream you know i had a, a few weird dreams and when i left um it just like there's a few uncomfortable dreams that i had but they've gone away the, i mean i did have one um like it only like i only had like one or two since i left but there was one where i was at the church and i was um i was trying to make some food for the members to eat and they were all ignoring me. And I was like feeling very uncomfortable that I was like messing up the food. And then like the kitchen team like was like looking at it like, what is it? Why is he giving us this messed up food? And like, wow. it was just like, I felt so uncomfortable. I'm like, guys, I'm trying to do something nice for you. Please be nice to me. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, that was just uh, one weird dream I had, but um it, it was like at the very beginning, I was having like a few weird dreams about like the situation, but you know, those for me have gone away. It's more like um, I've noticed that I've had like this weird sense of like mortality lately and a weird claustrophobia. Mm -hmm. I've had this like, weird image in my head about like um, death and like being stuck in the body and like being able to like, see and hear but not being able to move and feeling like you're drowning underwater like I have this like weird image in my head and like I think I that that like came from part, like in your dreams I had it in a dream like that kind of concept and then like after that it kind of haunted me mm. um, and then um you know yes. we're reading that book the um the mind body connection book yeah, you have to read it, Anthony. It is so fascinating. I mean, so much of our trauma um, that we experience is stored in our body and memories that we can't recall, you know, like 10 years of your our li your life, you know, there's a lot of memories that are probably still missing to you, right? Yeah, that's Isn't that it's, interesting. It's true. Um, and yeah, and the other thing I've been having is like this claustrophobia. I never yeah. had it before. But now, like, even seeing, like, on a TV, like, somebody, like, in a small space, all of a sudden, like, I can't even look at the screen. I have this really strange um, anxiety about it. And I'm not sure, I, I can't say for sure that this is related, to, but it was very much coinciding with when I left. Have you um, sought out therapy? Uh, I did. I did seek out um, therapy, and it ended up, like costing a lot of money <laughs> yeah that I didn't realize I'm like I have insurance and they care about mental health and I went to like two sessions and like, each oh one wait was... in America never mind <laughs> yeah and I'm like oh wait a second like how much am I paying like how much are you gonna put on my card and I'm like cancel future sessions please <laughs> you know it's so frustrating because people coming out of a cult literally have nothing we've been we have been you know Everything has been taken from us. What 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 do we have left? And so we can't afford therapy. And I think that they're. I think, I think we need a specialized type of therapy too, right? Like we need to find a cult therapist, somebody who knows what we've gone through. That would be ideal. Do you like have it. any advice for somebody who may be questioning or maybe trying to come out, or you know? Uh yes. Um, I would say you know really okay you know we know that the internet is uh called the tree of knowledge of good and evil but you know that's only when you look up bad things about the church itself if you go and just look up what is a cult and how do other cults operate you know you're not looking at any slander about the church so feel free you know like go look into what are cults you know and then you'll realize wow these people are telling the same story of my life and I would say that that's really eye-opening. Also, do your research. If someone tells you this is what happened in history, yeah, double check it. You know, make sure you do your own homework. 
look at the resources. Like, who, you know, you see like, uh, oh, this book is being quoted. Well, who wrote this book? You know, what is their uh, qualifications? You know, question more. It's it's very important to be able to, you know, use your mind. They say, don't use your own mind, but actually like, doesn't that just not sit well with you when you hear someone say, don't use your mind? Right. Yeah, that's, they say that's that all the time, point. Lindsay. They say, don't have your own mind. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, have 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 the mind we give you. Like right. trust your intuition when you're when you're feeling icky about something, like kind of look into it. Yeah, there's definitely a reason why you're feeling icky about something. <laughs> but I um I, I would say like those would be like uh big key things that at least were helpful to me. And then also like always always connect with your family. Um having that that kind of connection, like they taught us don't have a safety net don't have an, another option. That was like one of their teachings, but that's just one of their, um, their ways to separate you from your family and separate you from friends is if you have a way out of the church, then they lose power over you. Yeah. So always have these people because the Bible doesn't teach, don't have you know a connection with your family or your friends. You should have these. Because if things go south, and you know they will, have this support system ready for you, because yeah. they're gonna be there. You know, like even if you've treated them, like, you know, not the best for years, they're still there for you. I've been, you know, meeting new people, and having like new new connections with people, and also going and connecting with some of my old friends and. Uh, that's been definitely very helpful for me. And even more recently, I've had um, a really great group of people, um, you know, th like it's like a, a like this like family. And that's who I play tennis with today. And they've always like they're, they're really great people. And I felt like really connected with them and, um, you know, just getting out there and uh, making these different sorts of connections. You know, I don't want to like say too much <laughs> but sure. you know i think that things are um things are definitely like looking really happy for me right now and Good. you know i think also having this nice community of people whenever i feel like some sort of like weird reaction from you know the sort of uh damage that it's caused to me i at least i have other people like hey anyone else going through this and then the hands just start raising like yep me me <laughs> so yeah, um, you know, There's I, like I the community of the in between. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I feel like that's been like I've heard other people who take a really long time to heal, um, and get to a good place, and I just feel like really fortunate that I have a lot of tools that have helped me get to a good place, including you two and your uh, your podcast. Aww. So thank you guys for that's what you do. So to like I'm know just so glad that we're able to find each other because we were all so lonely. And thank you, Anthony, for sharing your story. And, you know, I mean, that's what helps people, you know, to hear what, what you went through. Yeah. No, I um I'm I'm I've been helped by other people's stories. So I thought it would be a good time to come. Yeah. And I didn't even hit everything on my list. So we're going to do a part two with Anthony eventually soon. Okay. Coming up soon. Coming up soon. We still have more to say, but if you guys uh, have any questions for Anthony, and we don't want to sleep deprive him, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we don't believe in sleep deprivation. We want you to get a full eight hours rest after playing a nice, healthy game of tennis. Yeah, with yeah. your yeah. new community. Yeah. That's great. That's so great. Thank you, Anthony, so much. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing, and I forgot what it was, but thank you for coming on. <laughs> We're so glad. And we're going to talk to you soon. Yes. Yeah, yes. we'll be back for our follow-up part two of this. Yeah. And uh, okay. I know how this episode concludes. Oh, yeah, you do. Requested. I was requested. I've been practicing different ones, and someone's like, just go for the weirdest one possible. All right, so. let's hear it. I want to hear what you got. <laughs> oh, man. All right, now I'm now the pressure's on. But Pressure, pressure. Woo, baby!